capsular injuries, uh, such as intertroch and peritroch fractures or really true basi cervical fractures, which are extra capsular. When you have a comminuted transcervical displaced fracture, uh, I really think the only way to get that truly anatomic is a formal open reduction. Certainly there's multiple ways to get at an open reduction. Uh, there's a Watson Jones anterior lateral, which is a more of an extensile approach. Uh, my personal preference is more of an uh, anterior approach with a lateral based approach if I need to put in fixation or when I put in fixation. Um, when I first started treating these, I, I did more of acute type bikini type incision, worried more about the cosmesis of the scar. And what I found was certainly didn't get the uh, exposure that I wanted. So I do more of a traditional Smith Peter type of anterior approach where you go between the sartorius tensor fascia lata, uh, take care of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And when you get down, you're on, you can sweep the rectus over medially, protect the neurovascular structures. And that really gives you an amazing window where you get a very good access of the femoral neck and the intertrochanteric region, trochanteric line. Here's some interoperative photographs of that particular patient. Over on the left side, this is actually with pulling traction. Um, you can see that the ability to get this in a closed fashion is, is in my hands, uh, not possible. And so she got a formal anterior open reduction. If you see on the right side, again, if you kind of make out the soft tissue shadows of that particular approach, you can really see that you get a nice view uh, of that transcervical femoral neck fracture. And we can also appreciate she's got a lot of uh, medial calcar bone loss and comminution there, which again, is high, high alert, high flags for uh, potential for uh, varus collapse and varus failure in my hands. All right, so here on, on the left side, this is after we obtained what we, what we considered to be an anatomic reduction. You can see a few things on this particular slide. Oftentimes I'll use a shantz pin on these really displaced comminuted fractures into the femoral neck. That gives me the ability to better have better control of the proximal fragments because oftentimes it's difficult to get that piece exactly where you need in, in order to key it in anatomically. Uh, the medial calcor bone loss, we actually use some calcium phosphate hydroxyapatite injectable uh, cement there in order to fill that, fill that void and provide at least some structural stability there. And as you can see here, pretty good anatomic reduction on both the AP and lateral view. Um, which is absolutely key in these cases. I chose to use a, a three screw construct. So again, I use a separate lateral based incision for putting in these cannulated screws. Certainly there's other fixation options such as fixed angle devices, such as sliding hip screws, plate plates and other things. But on this particular patient, she had a pretty small femoral neck. I uh, figured I had better control of my fixation uh, with these three screws. So you can see that we used a fully threaded screw here. Certainly partially threaded screws are an option which get, allow you to get compression across the fracture site. But when you have areas of comminution, uh, especially comminution along the medial calcar, if you get too much compression across there, you're gonna end up with a varus uh, malalignment uh, over compress that side. So and these particular screws are positional screws secondary to the comminution of the fracture pattern. With that particular approach too, you have really good access to the femoral neck. Um, you know, I leveraged some of the uh, adult training in terms of using some of these medial calcar locking plates. So this is a 2.4 millimeter uh, locking plate, which we use to but further buttress the medial calcar in that area of uh, comminution uh, for further support and hopefully prevent any type of varus collapse uh, in the future as she heals. So here she is, this is a three and a half months uh, post-op x-ray, um, starting to have significant healing along that medial calcar maintenance of our anatomic reduction on both the AP and lateral views. And then at this point, right, we don't know, but certainly there's no AVN as of yet. Certainly she needs to be watched closely, still at high risk for avascular necrosis with comminuted transcervical fracture. And hopefully I don't have to send her to Dr. Apsani here in the future for dealing with any of this problem. But so far, so good. Um, and a lot of uh, good key points here from a prevention of, of virus in the future. So some of the primary keys, really anatomic reduction, anatomic reduction, anatomic reduction. This is in my hands, really the most important thing. Uh, certainly closed attempts are, are warranted in certain situations, but seriously, uh, oops, sorry about that. Let's see here. Very, very low threshold for doing an open reduction in my hands. My personal preference is dual approach, anterior 
uh, based approach with a lateral base incision, but certainly others prefer a more extensile one incision lateral uh, anterior lateral Watson Jones approach. Optimize implants and implant position. I think the inferior neck calcar screw is extremely important for buttressing that area. You want significant screw spread uh, across the fracture site and femoral neck if you're using cannulated screws. Compression is, uh, is your friend in terms of fracture healing, but if that is only if the fracture pattern allows, I certainly use positional fully threaded screws for maintenance of anatomic reduction if comminution is there. And certainly fixed angle constructs um, uh, based off of fracture pattern and bone age and bone stock. Um, those are uh, in my hands uh, better used in uh, basic cervical or more extra capsular intertrochanteric fractures, but certainly they have their role. All right, here's, a, here's another uh, just great case. So this was 11 year old boy from, actually he's from Los Angeles and uh, he was vacationing overseas um, and uh, sustained a 200 foot fall off this cliff. How he uh, survived is a miracle. Absolutely no brain trauma, no head injury whatsoever, but essentially broke pretty much everything else, including this 3B open tibia, which required spatial frame and free flap among other things. And then as you can see, he has this left-sided femoral neck fracture. So if we look closely at this uh, femoral neck fracture, certainly there's uh, lots of things that kind of scream red flags, um, significantly high PALS angle. This is a vertical shear type fracture pattern, um, which is at high risk for varus failure. Certainly the trans cervical nature and high energy injury is a concern. And then also you can see again down here at the bottom of the medial calcar, uh, certainly there's a piece of comminution down there. All of these things, you know, heighten your awareness of, uh, uh, of potential complications going forward. This was his uh, initial construct uh, overseas. Um, and we can point out a few uh, keys here for helping us uh, you know, get a, a better primary fixation in the future. I would consider this a partial reduction or open internal fixation. You can see on both the AP and the lateral views is non-anatomic reduction. Uh, um, certainly the uh, implant position doesn't have anything along the medial calcar. And then also is you, specific type of implants. So this is a proximal femoral locking plate certain implants ang angle your screws in certain directions. And you can see how these basically aim in a, con aim in a conical fashion, right? In, in, in my hands, I certainly want better spread of the uh, screws at the fracture site in order to buttress that femoral neck. Uh, essentially, these particular screws are conical and going through the femoral neck in this particular orientation. In my hands, I prefer them to be more buttressing around the edges of the femoral neck and the fracture site. Uh, and I personally use an inverted triangle uh, when I'm doing either cannulated screws or trying to do a proximal femoral locking plate. Like I said, certainly I prefer to have uh, good fixation along the medial calcar as low as you can go uh, in order to buttress that particular area, but in a non-anatomic reduction, that may be a mood point. So this was his post-operative radiographs two weeks after uh, his operation. Certainly, I think we can all appreciate that this is not going to do well. Um, certainly hoping that this is just going to be okay is, is, is not a good situation. It's already in various malalignments. Um, the screws are already bending just at two weeks and even though he's non-weight bearing. So he was airlifted to Children's Hospital Los Angeles to the inpatient rehab unit, at which point I was called just to evaluate his orthopedic injuries. And as we can expect, uh, this is where he is four weeks after his initial fixation and fall, uh, with a continuing varus collapse screw cut out um, where he's got uh, screw penetration, penetration into the joint, which puts him at risk for chondrolysis. And certainly this needs some uh, TLC in order to get him into a better position, even though he's significantly high risk for even future complications. So essentially what we did was a, uh, a revision, um, open reduction and internal fixation. He had previously had an anterior lateral Watson Jones based incision. So we used that exact same one. Um, and um, we did a subtrochanteric osteotomy uh, closing wedge in order to optimize the uh, biomechanics of the fracture site. You can see the picture up top. It's not this particular patient because you can see there was a blade plate on this one used, but this is essentially the same type of osteotomy, which is a closing wedge osteotomy in order to position the femoral neck in a better uh, biomechanical advantage for, for healing purposes. 
You can see that we obtained an anatomic reduction along the medial calcar of the neck over here, but certainly where you see the arrow, there were certainly areas of continued comminution uh, and bone loss where we couldn't get a 100% anatomic reduction. But you can appreciate the green line here where we've essentially taken him from a high PALS angle shear force type three to a more uh, manageable type, uh, type one PALS angle, which optimizes biomechanical forces across that fracture site in order to allow for hopeful healing going forward. We used this uh, fixed angle device sliding hip screw, did not lock the hip screw portion here to allow for continued compression across the fracture site. And you can see the sliding hip screw is, is pretty close to perpendicular to the fracture site, which is, which is what you want. So here's his particular radiograph. So this is uh, 18 months uh, after, after his surgery. Miraculously, he is uh, walking back to his kind of normal-ish life, even though he does have some residual injuries from that 200 foot uh, fall that he's dealing with. But in regards to his femoral neck fracture, you can see complete healing. He does have a short femoral neck, but the relation of his greater trochanter to the top of his femoral head is still pretty good. You can see that the sliding hip screw did uh, provide some uh, continued compression, which allowed for continued healing across the fracture site. So success so far, no signs of avascular necrosis 18 months out from surgery. All right, another great case. So this is this is a, and they're always from an outside hospital, right? Whenever they have complications, the outside hospital, never your hospital. So this particular patient also from an outside hospital, if you look over here on the left side from the injury pelvis radiograph, you can maybe convince yourself, ah, oh, that may be a basy cervical, more, you know, kind of extra capsular type injury. But certainly on the intraoperative radiographs, uh, it appears to be more of an intracapsular injury with more of a sheer force type pattern. Uh, certainly in my hands almost always gets an open reduction because I find it very difficult to get those extremely anatomic in a closed fashion. You can see the vertical nature of, of the fracture pattern on intraoperative film. So here's the intraoperative radiographs from the outside institution. You know, AP doesn't look that bad, right? You know, it looks close to anatomic, um, but certainly when we look at the lateral radiograph, we can appreciate it's not an anatomic reduction. Certainly there's anterior and posterior cortical step-offs, uh, whether it's a rotation rotational uh, malalignment, but certainly not truly anatomic uh, positioning um, in this particular case. So here's his post-operative radiographs. It's kind of an oblique view of the, of the left hip. Again, not too bad. Reduction doesn't look too bad. Certainly not anatomic, but not that far off. Um, if we look more at closely at the fixation construct, certainly in my hands, I would have preferred this particular sliding hip screw to be a little bit deeper into the femoral head. We can leverage some of our adult uh, surgeons in terms of talking about tip to apex distance and inner trochanteric fractures, even though those are geriatric fractures. But I do like that tip to apex distance to be a little closer to the femoral head when it's allowed, especially in a patient who has closed proximal femoral physis and there's absolutely no concern for going uh, further into the femoral head. We can see that the threads of the sliding hip screw are just barely past the fracture site. Okay, and certainly, like I said, certainly I'd like to see those a little bit farther down. There is a derotation screw here, which is your cannulated screw outside of your sliding hip screw, which is my preference when I'm doing sliding hip screws as well. So here's a uh, six months uh, after that particular fixation. So again, we can all appreciate varus collapse. There's a partial union, but certainly there's a non-union along the medial calcar. And when we look at the CT scan, uh, we can see the screws are cutting out proximally. There's some healing along the uh, proximal femoral neck, um, but certainly uh, some non-union along the medial calcar and medial femoral neck. This particular patient uh, at 13 was uh, offered uh, total hip replacement uh, um, by the outside hospital and then say, came to our hospital for a second opinion and management. Um, this is the templating of the surgery that was performed by my partner actually this week. So no long-term follow-up on this particular patient, but it was done uh, this week by my hip specialist partner, Dr. Rachel Goldstein. So you can see similar um, um, revision type techniques to what I showed previously, um, templating for a uh, valgus closing wedge subtrochanteric osteotomy to try and optimize the fracture biomechanics ac across the femoral neck. Here's the intraoperative radiographs. 
uh, blade plate was used in this particular case because there was little, not much bone stock to work with along the inferior neck. Um, again, subtrochanteric closing wedge osteotomy. Um, the reason that they didn't do a formal open reduction uh, and bone grafting of the non-union uh, was because there was already some signs of potential avascular necrosis. Um, so they decided to not do that, but just try to optimize the fracture biomechanics and get this particular fracture to heal and, and certainly reposition the head in a better position. So some of the revision keys, uh, anatomic reduction is if relatively acute failures, again, anatomic reduction, anatomic reduction. So my personal preference is dual approaches with anterior and both lateral base incisions. Certainly you can do an anterior lateral Watson Jones approach, plus or minus bone grafting. You want to optimize fracture biomechanics. So certainly the workhorse for me is the uh, valgus closing wedge sub subtrochanteric osteotomy. Um, and then in the malunion cases, you're essentially repositioning that uh, femoral head. If you can allow for continued compression uh, as, con as comminution allows, uh, so sliding hip screws I use uh, often in these particular cases, and then fixed angle constructs plus or minus cannulated screws uh, are also uh, an, an option here, such as blade plates or proximal femoral locking plates. So in summary, you need to have a high alert. Femoral neck fractures have high rates of complications. Um, Cox of error prevention, anatomic reduction, anatomic reduction, implant selection obviously is important, but implant positioning just as important as implant selection. And then when you're talking about treatment, again, anatomic reduction, acute failures, and then optimizing fracture biomechanics with osteotomies, valgus closing wedge osteotomies, and fixed angled constructs are the workhorse for those revision surgeries. Thank you. Excellent talk, Dr. Lingworth. So we have one question. Uh, what are the indications for medial calcar plate? Uh, so, so the when I use that is when I'm when I'm looking at the fracture site. Okay, so, so if I've done that formal open reduction, and certainly if there's significant medial calcar bone loss, then I'm quick to put on that medial calcar plate. Uh, I don't see any downside to it. Um, certainly, um, certainly uh, you're already there. Uh, and if you have a really good exposure, which you should be able to get from a formal Smith-Peterson type approach, uh, I tend to put it on. Um, I certainly haven't, uh, you know, I don't have a huge series on him, but certainly haven't had any varus collapse when I've done that in these particular patients. So do you always use the bone sum supplement when you are using this, when you have the gap in the calca? So do you uh, always by always, you mean once I've done it. But certainly, certainly, certainly I'm not opposed to doing it. Um, you know, those, the injectable type uh, um, resorbable bone substitutes nowadays, I think are, uh, are um, have come a long way and uh, they're fairly easy to use, except the only downside to it is that cost, right? So there's a significant cost associated with these injectable uh, 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 cement bone substitutes. They're not cheap. Uh, but certainly I have no hesitation to use it in my particular hospital. I think it, it does provide some value. That's level five evidence for you. Okay. So uh, I think we will be going for the next topic. You can answer the other questions in the uh, question and answer box itself. So let me move on to the second topic. Uh, Avascular necrosis by Dr. Salil Opasani. All right, excellent. Thank you. Great talk, Ken. Thank you so much. Great, great pearls for everybody. <clears throat> I've been given the privilege to talk about avascular necrosis, one of the most dreaded complications from uh, femoral neck fractures. These are my disclosures. None are pertinent to this talk. I did want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Patrick Whitlock and Dr. Courtney Selberg from um, Cincinnati and from Colorado. They were co-authors with me on a recent um, presentation that we did for POSNA on this topic. And they have definitely contributed a lot to my knowledge on this topic. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have some similar themes to what uh, Ken just spoke about. Uh, these are very rare injuries, high risk of complications, 20 to 50% and potential for long-term disability, which is unique in our population where most children, you know, bounce back, recover from our surgeries and are 100% back to normal. 
Uh, the Delbe classification has been discussed and I think is important to guide treatment and has been found to be prognostic for complications. And in the systematic review from 2013, you can see that avascular necrosis is probably the um, most common and um, highest risk uh, issue that we have to deal with. And uh, the Delbe kind of classifies based on which fracture types have the higher risk of avascular necrosis. So highest in that type one. Overall incidence has been shown to be about 25%. Uh, the, and it's been associated with these variables. So age, older age patients have a higher risk of AVN, the greater amount of displacement, the location of the fracture, the quality of the reduction, like Dr. Ken was uh, emphasizing. Um, but I think some of the factors are within our control, and I think those would be timing and open versus closed treatment. So I'm going to um, first start off by talking about how to prevent avascular necrosis, and then we'll go into how to deal with it. And I think it's really important to follow these patients for at least two years uh, because AVN can show up even after that one year time point. Real quick to go through the vascular anatomy, I'm sure we're all familiar with the five phases that Ogden and Trueta initially described as the patient grows from infancy into adulthood. Uh, the proximal femoral physis acts as a barrier to the blood flow that's coming from the metaphysis into the epiphysis. There's some early um, blood flow coming from the ligamentum teres, but during that childhood, teenage years, it's primarily dependent on the uh, retinacular vessels, which are coming from the back of the uh, femoral neck. So with an intraarticular fracture going through that femoral neck, um, there's a high risk of avascular necrosis to the epiphysis. Some of the etiologies for this avascular necrosis that have been described, uh, there's thought that there could just be uh, disruption of the retinacular vessels. So when the femoral neck is fractured and there's 100% displacement, those vessels that are running along the back of the neck are disrupted. Some people think that it could just be kinked from uh, angulation of the fracture. And then there's also a thought about having increased intracapsular pressure. So the thought is that these vessels that are in the periosteum of the metaphysis are compressed when there's increased pressure within the hip capsule. So there's some interest in decompressing the capsule at the time of fixation. And obviously an open reduction allows you to have direct access and visualization of the fracture, but also to decompress that hematoma, which exists within the capsule. This is a slide that I stole from Jonathan Scheneker. Uh, I think it very nicely describes the way our bodies deal with avascular necrosis of the femoral epiphysis when you're an infant and you get AVN through DDH as, an, as a baby compared to perthes, which hits that middle group going from about five to 10. And then these fractures, which usually happen in the young teenage population, um, the avascular necrosis is, is addressed with creeping substitution. So there's a very long period of time where the femoral neck as well as the epiphysis is at risk of collapse and compression from uh, weight bearing. So treatment principles to avoid avascular necrosis, again, anatomic reduction is key, opening the capsule to decompress the hematoma. I think stable fixation is extremely important and it's important to know that it's okay to cross the physis for stability. And I also have a very low threshold for using a spica cast to minimize the rotation forces um, at the hip joint. And I think for, again, in my hands, very similar to what Ken was talking about, closed treatment is reserved only for non-displaced fractures and very young patients. In terms of uh, the timing, I think a systematic review showed that there was a 4.2 times higher risk of avascular necrosis if these fractures were addressed more than 24 hours after presentation. Other series haven't been able to show that early treatment, but you know, there's a lot of variable um, definitions for avascular necrosis. And in general, each center gets a pretty low number. So I think it's useful to um, pool our data and uh, try to see whether um, timing ends up being an important variable. In general, I'd say the consensus is to treat it urgently. You, you obviously wanna have the right team with you when you're addressing these injuries, uh, but you don't wanna have the patient wait for too long. In terms of decompressing the capsule, again, AVN rate is lower in several series, but a systematic review did not show a significant difference between formally opening the capsule 
Um, but in my mind, it makes sense to try to address all of those three factors that we think contribute to avascular necrosis. So either percutaneously sliding a cob up the neck as shown in this image or formally um, opening up the capsule is important. And I think another important principle is to avoid iatrogenic injury. So this is a teenager that presented with a posterior hip dislocation and in attempts to reduce it in the ER ended up getting a um, del bay 1b type fracture. So extremely important that these types of patients are reduced at our center um, in under anesthesia in the operating room in a very controlled environment. <clears throat> So before I go through and show all my disaster complications of avascular necrosis, I wanted to show one good case <laughs> that these fractures can be treated in San Diego uh, in a good way. So this is a 12 year old with a left type uh, two uh, femoral neck fracture after being thrown from a horse, underwent open uh, reduction. I prefer the Watson Jones approach. Um, I feel like it gives a good exposure, but I agree the Smith-Peterson is excellent, especially the closer you get to the physis, um, the better it is to get the reduction from anterior. So this was the construct that we used here. He is at two months post-op and uh, 28 months post-op healed well um, with no, no complications. So in my practice, I do like to uh, look for avascular necrosis. So my preferred technique is to get a bone scan at six weeks. I know there'll be some questions or debate about that. Uh, if we do find avascular necrosis at that time point, uh, there's things that I can do to intervene. And here's just a list of everything that can be done. I'll go through these throughout the rest of this talk. So first and foremost, I think extending the period of non-weight bearing. There's been lots of good animal models of perthes and um, studies showing that decreasing the pressure on the femoral epiphysis is not uh, extremely important to try to preserve its ferocity. So either using crutches or a wheelchair to try to keep this patient off of that hip for at least a year while it's going through that process of creeping substitution. There's medical management and I know um, <clears throat> there was a recent talk that went through the POSI um, WhatsApp group about medical management with DMARDs, steroids, vitamin D, calcium. Obviously, I think these are important, not the forte of an orthopedic surgeon, but um, our, we have our uh, colleagues in endocrinology that do employ all of these techniques. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about drilling of the uh, head and neck uh, with multiple epiphyseal drilling and, and um, core decompression um, techniques with a vascularized fibula, as well as osteotomy and salvage options. So I think first and foremost, it's really important to get the diagnosis early. Uh, so that could either be with radiographs, AP frog lateral, as well as that 30 degree flexion view, which shows the primary areas of necrosis, which happen on the anterior superior portion of the femoral head. Um, I prefer to do it with the bone scan, like we talked about, because these patients typically have metal uh, in their proximal femur, but there are some metal subtraction techniques to be able to visualize this with an MRI. And I think it's essential for early diagnosis to quantify the area of avascular necrosis and to um, figure out how much intervention this patient is gonna need. I just wanted to bring up the FECAT classification. I think it's the classic standard classification used for avascular necrosis going from zero to four, uh, with four being um, end stage uh, arthritis disease of the hip joint. There's also this concept of a Kerboul angle, which was published in 1974, where you're trying to quantify the arc of necrosis on the AP and the frog view. And basically by adding up those degrees, you get a quantifiable value of the severity of the necrosis. This has been published as a modified angle back in 2006, where you can use the MR to quantify the area of necrosis and grading it based on the amount of deformity, pain, and arthritis that the patient will get based on the extent of the head involved. The goals of treatment, again, I think are early recognition, prompt intervention, um, and getting to these patients before the femoral head has started to collapse to try to decrease pain, improve function, and um, keep um, minimize the effects of the avascular necrosis. So the indications for me are pre-early collapse, which is that FECOT zero to two B. So before you even start to see changes on the X-ray, I think is the ideal time uh, for us to intervene. Once you start to see that crescent sign and collapse of the femoral head and flattening, I think it's difficult uh, to ultimately preserve that hip in the long term. And I feel at some point they will end up getting a hip replacement, at least at our institution, um, and you start kind of preparing the family down that path. 
So to look at multiple epiphyseal drilling versus core decompression, I do have some cases of core, de um, core decompression that I did earlier in my practice, but now I've pretty much converted completely <clears throat> to this technique. These are some x-rays that I received from Tim Schrader from um, Atlanta. Uh, and the concept is that you're basically decreasing the intraosseous pressure by putting all these canals within the neck. Uh, you're trying to increase blood flow into the necrotic femoral epiphysis and stimulate new bone formation. Um, I think multiple small drill holes work a lot better than large bore instruments. And I think there's been a greater um, success rate in preserving the sphericity of the epiphysis with these smaller drill holes. The outcomes have shown improved pain, range of motion, and modified hair SIP scores, you know, one to four years after the injury, and a 10-year survival rate of uh, shown there, 96% with FECOT1. And ultimately, I think it may prolong the need for a total hip, but there's no definitive evidence that it actually alters the natural history of the disease. There's lots of adjuncts that are now been used, so uh, PRP, uh, bone marrow concentrate, mesenchymal stem cells. Basically, we've tried to think of everything possible to inject up those tracts once we've created them into the necrotic segment. Uh, I think the concept is to increase VEGF and BMP2 expression. So you're trying to stimulate the healing process while your osteoclasts are eating away the necrotic bone. You want to stimulate the osteoblast to preserve structure uh, to the head so that it doesn't collapse. Uh, I think further studies are needed to validate all of these findings. We recently, or actually just yesterday, had our meeting of the International Perthi Study Group. So uh, there was some great data presented by Craig Munns uh, from the uh, group in Sydney looking at um, bisphosphonates as well as the rank L antibody, which has started to show some early um, positive clinical results. So these are animal studies performed by Harry Kim at Texas Scottish Rite, so showing that um, a combination of bisphosphonates and BMP injected directly into the epiphysis helps preserve the structure of the femoral epiphysis. Um, bisphosphonates alone were not effective in the study from Sydney, and as well as this uh, review of literature performed by um, David Little and Harry Kim showed very little benefit to IV bisphosphonates alone. So there is a need to supplement with uh, some substances that are going to be proactive in, in uh, healing um, the defect. So the other option then is to uh, perform a femoral head allograft. So remove the necrotic fragment. Uh, this requires a safe surgical hip dislocation where you're able to quantify the size of the defect, remove all the necrotic segments, and then place a fresh frozen plug into its position. The optimal indication is a focal early um, impending collapse, a young compliant patient. Um, and so uh, some of the outcome studies have shown that it does restore the articular surface and sphericity. There's improved outcomes at 10 years out from the surgery. I'm gonna go through a case where that happened. This was actually in a Skiffy patient at our, at our facility. So a 13 year old male with a severe, unstable, acute slip capital femoral epiphysis who was treated with the modified Dunn procedure as shown here. Uh, the six week bone scan, you can see the area of necrosis of the femoral epiphysis on that side. So again, before any collapse um, as seen on the x-ray, um, you can see some screw penetration and an early sclerosis of the femoral head. So this was, you know, early in my career where I was still doing this extreme procedure for core decompression, uh, where you're removing the necrotic fragment, uh, packing it with bone marrow aspirate concentrate, um, backed up with prodense to try to provide some structural support. You can see four months after that revision, the head still starting to collapse, uh, but it healed fortunately with the kind of a small central necrotic area, uh, which almost uh, two years later, I went back to do a, a femoral head allograft procedure, removing the necrotic segment, drilling uh, the metaphysis from the front side, and then using this allograft plug. And then I have some follow-up data for that three months out and 16 months out now with some incorporation. You can see the head isn't perfectly spherical um, but the patient's pain has improved significantly. So the other options with the vascularized bone graft, uh, the concept is that it provides structural support. It increases vascularity into the necrotic fragment. Uh, however, it is technically demanding. We actually don't have much experience with this technique in, in San Diego, but it has been shown to 
uh, improve outcomes in terms of pain and um, the modified Harris HIP score. And the advantages are that it provides improved vascularity on the MRI, but however, there have been very minimal differences between the two techniques uh, in terms of the subjective outcome scores. Femoral osteotomies obviously are a mainstay for our um, peds ortho surgeons. The concept is to rotate the necrotic lesion away from the weight bearing area, eliminate shear forces and prevent progressive collapse of the head. There's a couple different options either to do the osteotomy intertrochanteric or transtrochanteric rotational osteotomy. Um, so typically, if you remember the blood supply to the femoral head, uh, if you're following the retinacular vessels, it's going to primarily support the anterior superior portion of the femoral head. So the posterior medial aspect of the head often re remains well vascularized, either through the ligamentum Weibrecht or um, primarily through that ligament. Uh, so um, this transrotational osteotomy described by Sujioka in 1974, we've done one case of that, which is shown here, the osteotomy is difficult to see, but basically after doing a greater trochanteric osteotomy, you're cutting the neck in this L-shaped fashion, and that allows you to perform almost a 90 to 100 degree rotation of the femoral neck. Um, so this patient uh, underwent an intertrochanteric osteotomy, a 12-year-old with a right femoral neck fracture. Uh, this was him two months uh, post-op. You can see a relatively good reduction, but early um, changes in the femoral head uh, and MRI at two months showing the areas of necrosis. After removal of implants, he underwent a varus osteotomy actually with a femoral head allograft for that necrotic segment. And here he is almost three years post-op again with a uh, reasonable outcome. So survivorship at five to 10 years of about 80% uh, using both techniques. So I'd say using the technique that you're most familiar and comfortable with. Um, some of the Salvage options include arthrodistraction, which is basically uh, limiting weight bearing of the femoral epiphysis by distracting the joint, allowing the necrotic segment to heal. Hip arthrodesis, which is pretty much not performed uh, anymore at our institution with the advances in uh, hip arthroplasty. So this is a 13 year old female that had a modified done after uh, skiffy, similar issues with the cord compression that I discussed previously. Here she is at two years out from that and needed a, um, a total hip to salvage that hip. So take home points, I think femoral neck fractures are extremely challenging. The primary goal is to avoid avascular necrosis using all the techniques that uh, Ken and I spoke about. Early diagnosis is extremely important and you need to try to intervene before you have any femoral head collapse. Ultimately, I'd say there's no holy grail for dealing with avascular necrosis of the epiphysis and it remains an unsolved dilemma, but these are at least all the options that you could try. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Salil Lupasani. It's a very comprehensive talk. Now, I cannot give time as we are running late for the uh, live discussion of the questions. Can you go to the question and answer, answer the questions? Yes, I invite no. the next speaker, Dr. Sandeep Patwadhan, to speak on preventing and tackling avian in fractured neck of femur. Thank you. Uh, thanks, so Omaraji, but avian has been dealt with, so I will talk on non-Indian fracture neck femur, yeah, learning yeah. through cases. So let me just rush through because we have already had some time uh, issues. All of you know that avian is the single most uh, complication, which is highest in the percentage, but non-unions are somewhere around 10% in Ratliff series and about 7% in Canalic series. But in India, we do get to see a lot of non-unions for social reasons. Delaying treatment is the commonest one. So I've put non-union causes in these three categories. Delays presentation is the commonest thing that we see here in the South, East, uh, South Asian continent. Within the delayed presentations also, there is early delay, which they come to us within six months or they come to us really late after two years, three years untreated. Failed osteosynthesis is the second cause where fixation issues, which have been highlighted earlier again. And lastly, if you have a pathological fracture of the neck of the femur, could be through a cyst, infection, or neuropathic joints. So I'll just show you some examples. This is a delayed presentation of a young girl about 13 years old who had a fall, fell from a tree, and was treated by a local bone setter, had limp and could not walk, but the pain had reduced and she could just about do a active SLR. 
so in these situations we prefer not to open that area except whatever early healing is happening so fix it in situ with a screw and convert the biomechanics by doing a subtrochanteric or intertrochanteric oblique valgus osteotomy and stable fixation so with this particular methodology i have been able to convert this uh, situation into a completely healed uh, fracture so an in situ screw a valgus subtrochanteric osteotomy fixed with a lock plate healed within 3 months without any long long term avian with a full range of motion this is a 9 year old child who came much later so he was about 9 years down after his trauma and he had again a coxa vara with a fibrous union and inability to load it completely limp while walking with pain so here again since this is in rel relatively decent position in situ stabilization a subtrochanteric osteotomy this these were the, day, the younger child i just used a prebent uh, dcp the humerus uh, media, medium medium size dcp and that went on to a satisfactory union without a vascular necrosis so the principle is in delayed unions we are not really trying to go in open the capsule do an anatomic reduction and compromise the vascularity any further so this is his long term follow up and he did pretty well This is another case which we had done in Ganga four years ago. Venkat will remember a 14 or 15 year old boy who had a 12 month non-union and the head already showed some sclerotic changes. So again, Dr. Taral and I we had done this. This was extraction film. So we did augment the calcar using an inferomedial fibular strut graft, and we did a valgus osteotomy and fixation. Again, no opening of the capsule. we just changed the biomechanics we drilled across the bone put a fibula as a strut this was a dead fibula no, not a live vascular fibula over a period of time you went you see that this went on to a satisfactory healing and the cystic areas and the sclerotic areas in the head also gradually started revascularizing and two years down the line this child has a pretty functional hip i think venkat has also removed the implants there was a little cam there which he has removed and the child continues to do well well we don't know whether this hip will last his lifetime he may still need a total hip replacement but you will have a better bone stock and he gets to use the hip for in, in the intermediate years with a good function the second issue for non union which i feel is fixation issues suboptimal treatment which happens in our country again now this child who had a displaced type 2 delbe fracture was treated with a percutaneous leverage technique and close reduction and a couple of cancellous screws had been put now these screws if you see the top screw seems okay but the lower screw was short and as expected it cut out it did not have any purchase now poor fixation is the commonest cause for creating a non union or a mal union and that luckily because there was a spica that saved the day this went on to heal pretty well at 3 months and we just got lucky this is his long term follow up at 5 years a little coxa valga but no avian and continues to function well the point to be made here is that don't compromise on crossing the fascial plate stability is important more than trying to preserve the physis in fracture neck femur i think that should be the take away message in older children also look at the powell's angles couple of screws placed like this are of no use because they tend to cut out stability has to be augmented if you are using only cannulated screws with a spica as a mandatory prerequisite never leave them without an ad additional protection stability is always enhanced by crossing the fascial line your reduction has to be perfect if there is comminution your implant has to be of a higher diameter or a sliding screw don't use pins and please go ahead and cross the growth plate people have a hesitation of crossing the growth plate in fracture neck femur cross the growth plate with impunity stability takes precedence over growth related issues i have developed a new my own technique for avoiding the spica i use a side plate so i use one screw after the reduction which is Uh, a stand alone screw but the second screw goes through a small recon plate or a dcp and you can see that i give a long leg knee brace and avoid the spica and we haven't had failures with this particular side plate fixation which helps us to 
rehabilitate the child faster. So these are a few examples where this is how we do uh, a better stable fixation. Of course, now we have the AO pediatric hip plate for those who can afford, again, affordability, because this plate cost about 35 to 40,000 rupees. So the keys to success are an accurate reduction and adequate stability, which may require open reduction. And in the older child, eight, nine, 10, adolescent, pre-adolescent, please look at Powell's classification and don't rely on only two short screws because that's not good. The determinants of AVN are the quality of reduction, look at the Lowell's S-curves, avoid varus and extension, and your implant options. If you're using cannulated screws, you must have a spica. A sliding hip screw in an older child is a very good implant to be used, and a, side slide, a locking side plate adds stability, limits varus collapse, but really it does not give compression across the fracture site because the lock screws don't offer compression. When you're placing your screws, Lundquist has published that you place them inferiorly and posteriorly towards the calcar. And as Dr. Ken showed, they have to be uh, spaced out rather than close to each other acting like one screw. An example in a 16 year old boy, a uh, hip screw, a dynamic hip screw is the treatment of choice. This is a case again, which uh, Mandar had shared, a type two fracture done by residents at the middle of the night. And you can see that they have put short screws, not crossing the physis. The boss was not happy, so he revised it, and he went ahead and did screws which were long. So stability-wise, yes, good. But there, there is another problem that we have back home, and that is infection. 15 days post-op with infection and discharge, the whole thing just collapsed. So a non-union in India also happens because of infection, repeated surgery within the first eight days. So implant removal and debridement was done after the wound was dry and there was a varus non-union there. So again, the planning here would be to do a valgus osteotomy and an in-situ fixation. So a subtrochantric, intertrochantric valgus osteotomy, oblique kind of an osteotomy, you can either, we prefer to use a DHS so that we can lateralize the shaft, as well as you can replace the upper screw with a fibula if you want, if you want to augment the uh, bone stock there. So this is what is preferred. These are the intraop images. And that is how it went on to a healing, a single fibula superiorly and a DHS. That's his two year post-op follow-up, no AVN and very good range of movement, functionally normal. Dr. Taral has also developed a jig, a 3D printed jig to help you with that osteotomy. And uh, he can speak about it more sometime in the future. The last issue is pathological fractures. Now this child who had a habitual dislocation of patella with congenital absence of pain was walking with a limp and had a very thin uh, uh, neck of the femur. He had a fall, but he never complained of pain and he came with such a large amount of bone loss. Now this particular, again, I reconstructed the superior part with a uh, fibular stud graft and cancellous screws and put him in a thomas splint I was pretty sure that this is never going to heal because of the neuropathic nature. But to my surprise, this went on to a satisfactory healing. And the bone graft got incorporated so well that today is walking around pretty nicely. So the non-union got tackled, but again, you can see some patchy sclerosis there and some lysis, maybe some avian is setting in, but he's doing well, no pain and walking around nicely. We do get cases with osteomyelitis, post-septic arthritis, and a fracture neck femur. Now this, after the wound was dry, again, a subtrochantric osteotomy was done to correct the biomechanics. You can see after the osteotomy, actually the head has become avascular. But over a period of time, it went on to revascularize. We did a trochantric transfer later, and at maturity, this is his position of the hip with really good function. So that is another situation. So we were fortunate to be invited to write the current concepts review on non-unions in fracture neck femurs in children. And what we have found that fractures in neck of femur are non-unions happen because of failures of fixation or delayed presentation. If there is a delayed presentation, evaluate the neck, how much is available to you, how much of the fibrous tissue is there, rule out a pathological fracture. The plan is in situ stabilization, avoid unnecessary open reduction in delayed cases and reconstruct the neck using fibula stud graft superiorly or along the calcar depending on the defect, add a valgus osteotomy and make sure your fixation is with a stable implant. 
failures of fixation, impro improper fixation, improper implant, failure to address the biomechanics, and rarely infection. Remove the implant again. Here, if the bone stock is good, a simple valgus osteotomy and a stable implant should do the trick. To prevent a non-union, adequacy of re reduction is the key. A stable fixation, a side plate should be added for type 2, 3, and 4 fractures. Younger kids, cannulated screws, but spica is mandatory. Older kids, use a side plate. And please cross the growth plate with impunity. If the neck gets resolved, fibula is an excellent choice. Achieving good calcar contact is essential, and judicious valgus osteotomy is important. In the adolescent age group, look at the vertical shear neck combination and use a dynamic hip screw. So reconstruction will work well if you follow few principles of calcar contact, changing forces, and using a good decent implant. Avian obviously needs to be watched for. Thank you very much. Sumaraju, you need to unmute yourself. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Sandeep Patwadhan. It's an excellent talk showing a variety of cases. Yeah. And uh, uh, we have a few minutes, so I have one question to Dr. Salil. So some people are using intralesional bisphosphonates. Does it really make any difference uh, apart from the intravenous bisphosphonate for the yeah. I, I honestly don't uh, think that it will make an impact. So if you if you look at the function of it, basically you're going to slow down the osteoclast and you're going to slow down the collapse. But unless if you're bringing something in to help speed up the healing process, uh, I think eventually once the child starts putting pressure on that necrotic head, it will collapse. So I think bisphosphonates alone isn't going to be enough. And there's a lot more studies looking at IL-6 to decrease the inflammation and BMPs to help speed up the healing that might work, but clinically none of that has been shown to be effective yet. So there's another question in the question bank. What is the youngest years where a patient was advised uh, replacement surgery, hip replacement surgery? Yeah, I responded to that. So it was 12 at our institution, but... Um, uh, and obviously these would be done with a skilled arthroplasty surgeon who does very high volume of them. But at our place as well, what do you think? Yeah, it's but certainly around there, 12 or 13. We do, um, I certainly don't do arthroplasty, but we have two surgeons who do quite a few. And I have definitely seen kids as young as 13. Um, so I don't know the youngest age, but certainly in that, in that, in that age range. So, but uh, doesn't it worry that the uh, process doesn't grow with the child? No, I think most of the growth of the triradiate cartilage as well as the proximal thermal physis is done at that time. Uh, most of these implants end up being very small to fit into the femur, uh, but a very large head to try to prevent redislocation. So I think in your early teens, um, the implant can survive into adulthood. But will definitely need to be revised in their 30s or 40s. So it lasts so long, 15 years for a child? That's That data isn't there yet, but there, there's been a lot of case series with young adult uh, total hips. Most of those patients end up being in the 20s or 30s. This 12 year old has lasted, but who knows how long that will last. Yeah. Certainly it's not the, you know, certainly it's a salvage option, right? I mean. Nobody's right. advocating for a total hip uh, be a common treatment in a 12, 13 year old, but sometimes it's the best option. Doesn't mean it's a good one. So on behalf of Posey, I thank all the three speakers for the excellent talks. So it shows that the fractured neck of femur is not yet fully salvaged, especially in India. One of the reasons is we still compromise. And the message I got from these talks is attention to the detail and uh, following addressing all the factors which are playing in their roles and not compromising is probably going to give us the best result. In, uh, in spite of the anatomical reduction, urgent need, I think we should also have low threshold for hip spica. So sometimes we get impressed by our own fixation and try to avoid the spica and may still end up in trouble. Thank you very much. Back to the president and secretary. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, all the speakers and uh, moderator, Dr. Samaraju. Now we go to the next session, and I invite the moderator of the next session, Dr. Viraj and Dr. Venkat, to take over and to run the free paper session. Thank you. And I would request Salila and Dr. Ken to be around to enjoy the free papers and ask questions because uh, your inputs are valuable, guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Zirin Bhai, and uh, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, we, this, uh, again, session is of free paper session where we are uh, going to have uh, different presenters. Um, we are uh, very short span for the presenters as well as for the question. Can I request Venkat to please uh, give some house announcements? Venkat, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. So the free paper session uh, is going to start now. We have uh, seven papers for discussion today, and each presentation will be of, of five minutes. And uh, question eight and papers, answers will be taken for eight papers. We have eight papers. papers today. Okay, okay, eight papers, and uh, each presenter gets five minutes to present the paper and two minutes for question and answer session. And at the end of five minutes, uh, the video will stop automatically. I think Dr. Diren has uh, arranged for it, so. You will exactly have five minutes. I request all the speakers to stick on to the time and probably Viraj, we can move on to the first paper directly. Yes, Ashok, so, uh, please. The first paper is by Dr. Chaitan. I'm going to speak on Parthi's disease, Dr. Chaitan. Does the outcome differ in children with Parthi's disease presented at stage of avascular necrosis and at early stage of fragmentation? Parthi's disease is a self-limiting Osteochondrosis of the capital femoral epiphysis. The prime aim of treatment of Pretty's disease is to prevent the femoral head deformation. The preventive strategy for treating Pretty's disease must be implemented in the early course of the disease. However, there is no consensus regarding how early one should intervene. The aim of my study was to determine the outcome, both clinical and radiological outcome, of children who presented in the stage of avascular necrosis, but is stage one and early stage of fragmentation, stage 2A, as per the modified Elizabeth Town classification. My materials and methods, all the consecutive children with birth disease were prospectively followed up to skeletal maturity. The treatment protocol was as followed. All the children, both gender, unilateral and bilateral hip, with birth disease, those with, without exclusion were treated non-operatively, whereas those with exclusion they were treated operatively. My inclusion criteria, the children who presented in either stage 1 or stage 2A, age less than 12 years at presentation, and those who were skeletally mature at the final follow-up. My demographic data, 195 cases were collected, out of which 138 cases were in stage 1, and 57 cases presented at stage 2A initially. 162 hip underwent the operative treatment, whereas 33 hips underwent non-operative treatment. The final outcome evaluation, the clinical evaluation was assessed using pain, range of movement of hip, Trendelenburg test, and shortening. Whereas the radiological evaluation was based using the Stuhlberg classification and the sphericity deviation score. The difference between both groups was evaluated using the chi-square and independent t-test. A p-value less than 0 0.05 was considered significant. My results are as followed. When it comes to gender and treatment, there was no significant difference between the stage of avascular necrosis and the stage of early fragmentation. The age of onset, the age of healing, the age at skeletal maturity, and the total follow-up duration was comparable between the both stages. Clinical outcome was similar in both groups. The range of movement was similar in children with both stages of presentation. When it comes to radiological outcome, the Stuhlberg, we noted that those who were, who were presented in the early stage had a lower Stuhlberg compared to the stage of early fragmentation. However, there was no significant difference between both stages and also within between the operative group and non-operative group. When it comes to the sphericity deviation score, we noted that in the operative group, both stages had a similar outcome, but in the non-operated group, we noted that the stage two 
hips, goes together with the stage two hips, had a higher sphericity deviation score compared to the stage one. But there was no significant difference between the both groups. A seven-year-old boy presented with a right hip pain. He presented in the stage one, stage one of the modified Elizabeth Town classification, as shown on the radiograph. He underwent the virus derotation osteotomy, and he was followed up to the skeletal maturity, where we noted that he had a good range of movement of hip and also a stool bulk lost one hip, implying if a successful, a good outcome. A 10 year old boy presented with the stage 2A, the early fragmentation at presentation. He underwent also the virus derotation osteotomy. And at skeletal maturity, he also had a good range of movement of the hip and a stool bulk lost to hip. Conclusion of my study. The overall outcome is good for children with the early presentation. However, the outcome is not different between the stage of avascular necrosis and the early stage of fragmentation. The implication would be that the preventive strategy can be effectively applied in the early stages of Pertis disease till the stage of early fragmentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chaitan. Yes, sir. The paper is open for the questions or discussion. Yes, Salil, would, would you like to ask something? One question. Yes, please. That would be yeah, wonderful. So I, I was wondering if, if the surgery has been shown to be so effective in stage one and two A, is there any indications to continue pushing that to to two B and beyond? Uh, the, the thing is, when uh, Dr. Professor uh, Benjamin Joseph has found in his studies that uh, once the patient reaches the stage 2B, it's already reaching an irreversible stage where the head already has been deformed. So mm -hmm. the uh, aim of my study was to see that, uh, to compare the stage 1 and the stage 2A, because we think that once the stage 2B sets in, it has a, usually has a poor outcome because the femoral head has already been deformed. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some alternate ways to address that, maybe with pelvic osteotomies. But yes, so once the once the femoral head has deformed, then we go for the uh, uh, like we we have those hinge abduction and all uh, problems which come. And then, as you said, we we can do the pelvic osteotomy or even go for the valgus uh, oste osteotomy also. So to get great, excellent study. Thank you. Yeah, Chaitan. Yes, sir. So we do know that uh, from Benjamin Sir's paper that uh, you, if you do a video in a stage of avascular necrosis, he says that the stage of the duration of fragmentation is less. Uh, yeah, so yes. did you look into that in, in this particular study? Uh, yes, we... What noted, about the duration of the stage two? Did it decrease with your early video? Uh, we noted in 12 hips, but actually uh, in, uh, 12, in 12 hips out of my series, they actually bypass the stage of fragmentation, actually. If we do in the stage of uh, avascular necrosis, 12 hips actually didn't have uh, the, the duration of the stage two was actually went directly to the healing stage that was found. And uh, uh, Dr. Amrinder Kumar Singh also has published a paper yeah. regarding this, but in some, if the, the key is early diagnosis, and if it has exclusion, we do the virus derotation osteotomy and it has a shorter duration. By process, but I mean, I just wanted to know what 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 happened to that in this data in this set of patients. Does it hold true also? That's why I just wanted to ask you. Yeah, I think uh, there are no we are short of time. Yeah, move on to the next paper. Shall we move to the next paper? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Chetan. Uh, now, yeah. can I invite Dr. Lau Kapoor uh, to speak on cost-effective options of limb salvage in pediatric bone sarcomas, minding the problem and finding solution in developing countries. Dr. Laukapur, please. Respected panelists and delegates, I'm presenting on the topic cost effective reconstruction options of limb salvage, pediatric bone sarcomas, minding the problem, and finding solutions in developing countries. Limb salvage in pediatric bone sarcomas presents unique challenges as most of these lesions are located around the physis. Limb salvage consists of tumor resection followed by reconstruction of the skeletal deposits. Obtaining adequate margins is the principle in the management of bone sarcomas. This can often result in sacrifice of the physis or injury to the physis, which can result in limb length shortening or deformity. Expandable or growing processes have been developed as a solution to limb length inequalities after sacrificing the physis. A major drawback of these is the high cost of the implants, which may run into lakhs and is not easily affordable. 
purpose of this study was to evaluate the functional outcome following resection and reconstruction of the bone sarcomas in pediatric population using cost-effective reconstruction methods. We conducted a prospective study between January 2017 and December 2019, which included patients under the age group in age of 12 years with primary malignant bone tumors undergoing reconstructions other than endoprosthesis with a minimum follow-up of one year. Extracorporeal radiation therapy includes re-implantation of the patient's own bone post-sterilization with high-dose radiation. It is indicated in diaphyseal tumors which have not crossed the physis without any pathological fractures and good quality bone. This is an example of an 11-year-old female with osteosarcoma of distal femur undergoing trans epiphyseal resections. Refixation was done after the tumor was treated with extracorporeal radiation therapy. We use B osteotomies, locking plates, and intramedullary fibula for stability. This is the uh, nine months post of uh, X rays showing union at both the osteotomy sites. The mean time to union in our study was. Uh, for the diaphyseal osteotomy, it was 7.9 months, and for metaphyseal osteotomy, it was 5.9 months. Uh, reconstruction using uh, vascularized as well as non vascularized fibula. The indications are diaphyseal tumors, which have not crossed the physis. Uh, in the presence of pathological fractures and poor quality bones, this can be used as an effective reconstruction method where ECRT is not indicated. This is an example of a seven-year-old male with adamantinoma tibia. Wide resection and tibialization of fibula was done. Uh, this is the 18-month follow-up showing remodeling and hypertrophy of the graft. The patient was able to uh, walk bearing full weight. Reconstruction with cement spacer is an another uh, cost-effective alternative to endoprosthetic reconstruction for tumors crossing the epiphysis, necessitating a joint uh, sacrificing resection. This is an example of an 11-year-old male with osteosarcoma proximal tibia, tumor with tumor crossing the physis, tumor resection was done, and knee arthrodesis was done with canal plate and cement spacer construct. construct. Uh, for this construct, only the central epiphysis is breached with the nail, and it is ensured that the screws uh, through the plate spare the physis to minimize the damage to the physis. A gradual protected weight bearing after six weeks is started. A limb shortening is compensated with cheap screw raise. A reconstruction with cement uh, sp a spacer is done for tumors involving the proximal humerus. This is an example of an 11 year old male uh, with the uh, Ewing sarcoma proximal humerus, tumor crossing the physis. Resection was done and reconstruction with cement spacer over intramedullary canal anchored to the glenoid with mesh. Uh, this procedure is associated with a uh, severely restricted shoulder range of motion because of the sacrifice of the major. Uh, major part of the deltoid as well as the rotator cuff, but it results in a st stable shoulder, which is necessary for optimum elbow function. Pelvic uh, resections uh, for pelvic tumors are complex, and as well as the reconstructions are complex. We routinely use proline mesh for uh, reconstructions following resections around the periestabular regions. The femoral head is anchored to the nearest available healthy bone with proline mesh. This is an example of an 11-year-old female leaving sarcoma right ileum with undergoing type one and a half pelvic resections with mesh plastic. Most of these uh, patients are able to walk unassisted, although with some gait abnormalities. Uh, the study consisted of a total of 87 patients with osteosarcoma being the most common diagnosis. The mean age was 8.4 years. A total of 21 patients underwent ECRT, 9 with fibula reconstructions, 34 knee arthrodesis, and 13 patients with uh, spacer of the proximal humerus. 10 underwent mesh plastic for pelvic resection. Distal femur was the most common site, followed by proximal tibia and proximal humerus. Infection was found in 12 patients. Does the outcome differ in... Thank yeah, the paper is it open, open for discussion. Really nice Five minutes up. Yeah, Dr. Lo, can I ask you one question? Yes, sir, please, sir. Yeah, so what is the rate of uh, infection as well as a uh, uh, pathological factor for implant failure, particularly if uh, you use the allograft or uh, extracorporeal radiation if you use in your series? Uh, sir, for uh, ECRT reconstructions, uh, we had uh, uh, three infections and three patients had implant failure. 
As, and uh, there were uh, another complication of non unions uh, four patients uh, had non unions at the latest follow up and so uh, for uh, we mostly do not use allografts uh, here uh, because most of the tumors are near to the physis so we have to use osteoarticular allograft but uh, that we use for mostly for adults not for children as well. but this is a huge rate of complication isn't it so any any solution for that you would recommend uh so it, uh, these bo uh, bones are actually weakened by the uh, uh, uh radiation therapy uh, so the we are uh, we uh, use the cement spaces for these uh, but uh, so since in uh, pediatric population uh, the implants uh, uh, are not that customized because of the small bones and we cannot uh, use that uh, adult implants so yes we are still uh, finding solutions to these problems uh, Maybe fibula. Live fibula is a better option. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have used fibula, but uh, fibula is mostly used for smaller bones like tibia, uh, not for uh, femur because of the compression and the tensile forces. Uh, these easily break. Okay. Any yeah, other question? Yeah, we can move on to the audience. Yeah, we can move to the next paper, Viraj. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Doctor Lal. Uh, thank you, sir. We are next speaker, Doctor Rakesh, who is going to speak on septic arthritis, changing microbial biological profile. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Rakesh Shetty, fellow in pediatric orthopedics uh, at Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health Bangalore. Today, I will be presenting a paper on a changing microbiological profile in septic arthritis in children. So, we are, as we all know, septic arthritis is a true orthopedic emergency, and any delay in its diagnosis and treatment can lead to disastrous complications. And despite significant improvement in medicine and the availability of better antibiotics, septic arthritis is still a major cause of morbidity. Acute hematogenous septic arthritis is a very common condition in pediatric population, with staph aureus being implicated as the most common causative agent across all age groups in the last decade. But changing trends in microbiological spectrum and emerging drug resistance poses a big challenge. So we here present a microbiological profile of a pediatric patients treated at our orthopedic unit with septic arthritis between 2011 and 2020. And to evaluate any change in uh, uh, causative agent and emerging antibiotic resistance over time. So we have uh, done a retrospective analysis uh, from 2011 to 2020 of uh, children less than 16 years who are admitted to the clinical diagnosis of septic arthritis. Under the st standard protocol, we have done a genre of the and uh, trained pus or sanable food was sent for microbiological evaluation for both gram and culture. We also do a blood culture as a part of routine investigation and send it for bacteriological evaluation even before the start of uh, empirical antibiotic therapy. And the data was analyzed to map the microbiological profile. So a total of 50 patients were included in the study, with aspirate fluid showing isolates only in 56% of the cases, whereas blood culture could grow the organisms only in 22% of the cases. The most common organism was Staphylococcus aureus, followed by Klebsiella and Enterobacter species. So this was the summary of the results of the study, where the growth was noted in 56% of the isolates, and uh, out of which 39% were gram positive, 49% were gram negative, and 12% were others like Candida and tuberculosis. In gram positive, insulin sensitive staph aureus being the most commonest one with 14%, and Klebsiella being the more common in gram negative. So, this is a pictorial representation of the microbiological spectrum noted at the Indira Gandhi Institute. So, when we have plotted this in a time uh, line, uh, and uh, we have noted that the gram positive uh, organism have been the causative agent uh, at the early part of the decade, but when it comes to the later part of the decade, we have noticed that uh, more and more gram negative being the causative agent of septic arthritis in children. So, when it comes to the older children, still medicinal sensitive staph aureus uh, is being uh, isolated as a commonest microbe, whereas the gram negative resistant varieties like E. coli and Klebsiella were being predominant causing in neonatal septic arthritis. The bacterial strain also showed significant resistance to common antibiotic regimen. Resistance to cloxacillin was found to be about 60%. The results were strikingly different uh, because of the significant resistance to the most commonly practiced empirical antibiotic regimen like amphicillin or cloxacillin. But when cefazolin or ceftriaxone were used as an empirical antibiotic therapy, it showed a good response and better sensitivity. So, uh, the whole part is the gram post organism in particular, Staph aureus is still the most prevalent uh, etiological agent, and the empirical antibiotic therapy has been conventionally tailored to cover the same. So, the recommendations are like beta lactam stable penicillins like piperacillin and cephalosporins like ceftriaxone and cefazolin. 
However, the increasing rates of MRSA and resistant variety of gram negative like E. coli and Klebsiella causing primary septic arthritis have been reported. There are a few studies uh, from India and abroad which have claimed the same. These are the few studies uh, which have claimed that uh, there is an increase in MRSA gram negative organisms and also there is an emergence of uh, antibiotic resistance to the common antibiotic protocol that has been used in most of the hospitals. So 50% of our isolates had gram-negative organism and 10% had MRSA, which shows significant change in microbiological profile from gram-positive to gram-negative. And also the other striking difference was the fungal growth being noted in 7% of the uh, samples. And uh, which, uh, so there should be suspicion uh, when there is a presence of these factors like uh, immunocompromised status and subcultures have to be done. So these all trends should, uh, should be considered when planning diagnosis and therapeutic guidelines for septic arthritis. Though a significant resistance to common antibiotic regimen was noted, cephalosporin was uh, still uh, being susceptible uh, to most of the organisms. Like. So though the use of cephalosporin as an empirical therapy till culture sensitivity reports are available is found to be effective, increase in incidence of gram negative organisms has challenged such an approach. There is a changing, so the conclusion of the take home message is that there is a changing microbiological pattern towards the gram negative organisms and the community acquired MRSA and fungi. So there is a definitely a need to revisit our antibiotic protocols in septic acid. Does the outcome differ in... Thank you. Viraj, do you have any questions? I think we can ask the other people who are there. Yeah, Venkat, we can, maybe you can go ahead. There's a question from Samir Desai. How do you differentiate between community acquired and hospital acquired infection? Rakesh is. Rakesh, are you there? Not to be seen, Viraj. I think we can move on to the next paper. So, thank you, Dr. Rakesh, for that presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Alaric. Alaric is going to speak on straddling practice in India. Are they, are they hip safe? A survey of pediatricians, nurses, and caregivers. Over to Dr. Alaric, please. Good evening, everyone. I would like to present our study on swaddling practices in India. Are they hip safe? This study was conducted at the Bai Jorbai Wadia Hospital for Children in Mumbai. Swaddling, also called binding or bundling, is an ancient practice of wrapping an infant in cloths so that the movement of the limbs is tightly restricted. While swaddling has always been prevalent in the Eastern cultures, it is once again becoming popular in the Western world due to several benefits of improved sleep and temperature control, a reduced risk of sudden infant death syndrome, and faster recovery from painful stimuli as compared to a pacifier. Traditional swaddling is a proven risk factor for developmental dysplasia of the hip and several clinical and experimental studies have reported its close association with DDH. To minimize the deleterious effects of swaddling on neonatal hip development, the International Hip Dysplasia Institute and several professional organizations have recommended hip-safe swaddling, whereas the hips are kept in slight flexion and abduction, leaving room for the, for the limbs to move within the swaddle. Hence, the aims and objectives of our study were to determine the prevalent practices for infant swaddling in India, to find out why caregivers practice swaddling and who teaches them to do so, and to assess whether pediatricians, nurses, and caregivers are aware of hip safe swaddling. We conducted one time anonymous surveys of three groups of respondents pediatricians, nurses, and caregivers in a tertiary care, urban, pediatric, and maternity hospital in the city of Mumbai. Coming to our results, 45 pediatricians who comprised of 12 full-time faculty and 33 trainees all completed the survey. More than half of pediatricians routinely advise the mothers about swaddling and almost all teach traditional swaddling. When asked about the risk factors for DDH, while most identified breach as an important association with DDH, less than a third were aware that traditional swaddling is an important risk factor for hip displacement. 290 nurses belonging to various cadres, right from junior nurses to senior teaching staff, all routinely advise mothers on swaddling, and 99% of them advise traditional swaddling. 
When asked where they learned about swaddling, more than two thirds of the nurses said that they learned it during their training itself, while a third of them learned it from their family members. 100 caregivers who were attending with their children at the Bell Baby Clinic of a hospital were also surveyed. 90% of them routinely swaddle, swaddled their infants and all used traditional swaddling. When asked where they learned about swaddling, while most of them learned it from other members of their family, especially the women in the family, about two thirds of them learned it from the nurses during the Well Baby Clinic visits. When asked why they swaddled their children, while most talked about the importance of sleep and providing warmth to the child, worryingly, more than half of the nurses and caregivers felt that swaddling was important to straighten the limbs of the child so that the child would have no problems when they started walking. When asked about the awareness of hip safe swaddling, only 7% of pediatricians, 4% of caregivers, and none of the nurses were aware of hip safe swaddling. Despite various position statements made by the International Hip Dysplasia Institute and several other global organizations, the importance of hip safe swaddling has not yet percolated down to healthcare providers and lay people in our country. Therefore, this provides us several potential strategies and a multi-pronged approach to create awareness about hip safe swaddling in our country, while official institutional policy in every uh, maternity and child hospital, to have periodic nurses of, uh, training of nurses, pediatricians, and fellows, as has been done in our institution, to train mothers on the importance of hip safe swaddling during well baby clinics, having informative posters displayed in clinics and wards, and to develop a liaison between POSI and the Indian Academy of Pediatrics to develop position statements on hip safe swaddling. It is also good to include it in the curriculum of training of the medical trainees and nurses, and at the government level, to train ASHA workers, midwives, and other allied professionals on the importance of hip healthy swaddling. So in conclusion, traditional swaddling is the norm in India. It's deeply rooted in cultures, born out of misbeliefs and propagated by a lack of awareness. And we feel that training in hip safe swaddling targeted specifically at nurses and pediatricians is extremely necessary to create an awareness and change practices in our population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alaric, for that lovely presentation. Uh, I think there may be a lot of questions. Salil, would you like to ask something to Alaric? Yes, please. Excellent presentation, Al. Nice to see you. <clears throat> you know, so it's it's been difficult for us to get the message out to our pediatricians and nurses as well. And I think all your approaches are excellent um, because it, it really does need a combined effort. My question to you is, do you think swaddling a completely normal child can cause hip dysplasia? Or do you think that type of traditional swa swaddling is only dangerous in infants that are at risk for dislocating or having instability anyway? Uh, thanks, Ali, that's a great question. I really don't think the literature is clear on that aspect, you know? Who really is at risk? Uh, are those the children who have potentially uh, hip laxity and therefore the risk of, of uh, hip displacement because of swaddling? Um, I think that would be very difficult to answer that question unless we do some sort of population-based studies. But for now, I think it uh, behoves us to recommend that we avoid traditional swaddling in, uh, you know, across the board because we know that that's an important risk factor. But uh, it would be difficult to answer that question. Any other question? Okay, thank you, Dr. Alirik, for the lovely presentation. Can I uh, invite the next speaker now? Uh, the, the next, next speaker? Uh, speaker is actually Dr. Ashish Kumar. Ishani Chaudhary is not there, so you move on to the next paper. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ashish Kumar is going to speak on extracorporeal radiation therapy and reimplantation after wide recession of malignant bone tumors in children. Hello, everyone. Good extracorporeal radiation therapy and reimplantation after wide resection of malignant bone tumors in children. I am Dr. Ashish Kumar Ragasi, and this study was done at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. As we all know, malignant bone lesions are more common in skeletally immature patients. Limb salvage in this age group is specifically challenging because of the unfused physis. Principal 
However, it remains the same that is why the section of the tumor followed by reconstruction of tumor. Extracorporeal radiation therapy and implantation is a biological method of reconstruction where the tumor or patient tumor own bone is reused after re radiation and is reimplanted using suitable implants. It is indicated mostly in diaphragial tum tumor with good bone quality. It has the advantages over other method of reconstruction that is we get a enlarged graft. It obviates the need for a bone bank and avoids the issue of allograft procurement and the risk. It is, however, not suitable for weak bones and not suitable for tumor involving joint or invading phases. Histologically, the resected tumor cannot be uh, analyzed, which is a uh, useful tool to tailor for the chemotherapy. And the rehabilitation time is also quite long. Uh, we retrospectively studied all the skeletally mature patient with malignant tumor of bone treated in our institute from January 2015 to January 2020 by this method. We assess the functional outcome using musculoskeletal tumor society score. We look upon for the time to union and we also looked upon for the complication in general and specific to this method of treatment. In this method, what we do is after resection of the tumor, uh, the tumor is transferred into separate trolley and the soft tissue is removed. Intermedial uh, content is also removed. The bone is uh, washed using uh, normal saline and betadine and is then wrapped in wet trial gap from where it is sent for radiation and a dose of 50 gray is given. The irradiated bone is then reimplanted using suitable implants like nails or plates. In our series, there were 32 patients. Ewing sarcoma was the most common bone tumor and femur was the most common bone involved. At two years of follow-up, 20 patients were avail available for the assessment. Two patients had local recurrence for which they underwent amputation. Seven patients died of the disease and three patients were lost to follow -up. The mean musculoskeletal tumor society score was 28 and time to union at the diaphyseal site was nine months and metaphyseal site was around seven months. In our series, the most common complication was non-union with or without implant failure, which was seen in four patients. Two patients have local soft tissue recurrences. However, no, none of the patient had any recurrences in the irradiated tumor wound. And mean limb length discrepancy was around two centimeter. Wound complications was seen in three of the patients. Uh, to enhance bony union, what we did was uh, we used fibular strand graft. Uh, we did a chevron osteotomy, which uh, enhances the uh, the bony contact area at the diaphyseal uh, site and uh, it also provides additional stability. Uh, we also uh, used a separate plate uh, at the diaphyseal site to provide additional stability. This is a case of 10 year old male with having sarcoma of the femur. Here we can see uh, the chevron osteotomy at the diaphyseal site with additional plate. And the, at the two year of follow-up, patient had good functional outcome. He was able to walk without support. He had a good range of motion of the knee joint. Here's another case of eight year old female having sarcoma of the distal tibia. Here the tumor was not invading the physis. And here we can see uh, additional plate is being applied at the diaphyseal site with a good union at both metaphyseal and diaphyseal site. And the patient had good functional outcome. Here is another male patient with even sarcoma of the calcaneum. Uh, it took around 14 months to unite at this site. And the patient had good functional outcome. He was able to walk without support. So the take home message is extra collaborative radiation therapy and implantation is cost effective method of reconstruction. It obviates the need of bone bank the fibula graft and additional method of fixation, uh, like using additional plate and chevron osteotomy enhances the bone union. It uh, helps to avoid future multiple surgeries. Thank you, Ashish. We have a question from one of the delegates. What is the time span for preparing the resected specimen irradiation and bringing it back to the theater? Can you so, answer that uh, question? Uh, hello, sir. So it takes around 30 to 40 minutes, uh, uh, depending upon the size of the resected sample also, uh, because uh, many a times, uh, if suppose the sample is small, 
so um, it doesn't take a lot of time but in and around uh, around 30 to 50 minute was the average time all right thank what you. is the rate of local recurrence what is the rate of local recurrence dr ashish sir uh, local for- recurrence local soft tissue recurrences was seen four of the patients sir uh, none of the patient had any bony recurrences in the irritated bone so oh, thank you is, is there any question venkat from any other audience no i don't nothing nothing else so we are going to move to the next paper so oh, thank you dr ashish it was a lovely presentation uh, i will ask we will request dr ishani shah to present her paper on is bone consolidation changed by plating after lengthening of the tibia a review of 35 cases dr ishani please the study was carried out at all the hirons hospital the technique of plating after lengthening was popularized by wagner in the 70s with the wagner device the advantages of this being to reduce the time in an external fixator while protecting the region rate as it consolidates removing the fixator early helped with the range of movement as well our aim for this study was to find out if the bone consolidation changes with plating after lengthening and to analyze the bone healing index the external fixator index and the time to consolidation retrospective analysis of 26 patients was done from 2007 to 17 35 tba underwent plating after lengthening at a mean age of 10 years There were 33 unilateral and one bilateral tibia. 19 children underwent one lengthening, six underwent two lengthenings, and two underwent three lengthenings. 21 children had a congenital cause of shortening. Three had a shortening due to a sequelae of infection, and two had a developmental condition leading to the limb length discrepancy. Most of the osteotomies were diaphyseal. Gradual lengthening was done with a fixator at 0.75 millimeters per day. Following the lengthening, the plate was inserted on the lateral surface of the tibia. Follow-up was weekly for pin sites and bi-weekly in the lengthening phase. In our health system, there was a slight delay in theatre availability for the plating. After the plating, follow-up was four weekly. Touring fixator was used in most of the cases to avoid plate overlapping the pin sites. The entire fixator was wrapped in a swab to shield it off from the operating field. and submus- submuscular plating was done with the mini incisions all children were followed up for a mean of 4.3 years 5 cm or 19% lengthening was achieved in 78 days initially the time to plate substitution was higher but this improved towards the end of the study mean being 24.7 days this can be optimized further to 7 days with planning with prior planning external fixator index was 23 days per centimeter when using only external fixator for lengthening the external fixator index is equal to the bone healing index when assessing combination techniques these values are different and the bone healing index must reflect the same stage of maturity as with the classic external fixator we assess the column to be mature when it was homogeneous without defect and 75% of the width of the original bone with corticalization in at least one cortex in each view consolidation was seen in 192 days following the osteotomy bone healing index was better in children younger than 12 years knee flexion of more than 90 degrees was achieved in 153 days we estimated the bone healing index if the lengthening was done only with an external fixator as three times the total time to lengthen including the latency period upon the centimeters of length gained improvement of bone healing index in our pla- plating after lengthening was statistically significant suggesting that bone was healing faster with that technique there were complications two children sustained fractures following injury which were treated conservatively infections five superficial and one deep were all treated with antibiotics the nerve palsy that occurred during lengthening did not recover the one after plating completely recovered 23 patients opted for the plates to be removed This is an example of a diaphyseal lengthening followed by lateral plating and this was a metaphyseal diaphyseal lengthening followed by lateral plating comparing our bone healing index to fixator only lengthenings in literature it was comparable or better with our osteotomy being diaphyseal comparing our study with plating after lengthening in literature our bone healing index was better than the others to conclude the technique reduced the time in fixator 
which can be further optimized by planning plate substitution seven days following completion of lengthening. Consolidation of the regenerate is faster than in most other studies. Since the fixator is removed early, joint movement and limb function recovers early. Complications of sepsis are low since the plate is away from the pin site and the intramedullary canal is avoided. The same technique can be used again for repeat lengthenings on the same limb. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. It was really, really a good presentation. I must uh, congratulate you for the nice series of the cases. Salil, you, uh, yeah. Salil, would you like to have some question to Shani? No, no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Great, great series. Great presentation. There is a question from Premal. He's asking whether the patients were adult or as well. Or all no, we had only no, we had only children with the average age of ten years. The oldest child was sixteen point six years. Hello, Any chance of implant failure, Ishani? Implant failure? No, we didn't have any implant failure in the series. Hello. John, would you like to ask some question? <laughs> Yeah, so Shani, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, Sandeep, please. Yeah, so was the plate applied after removing fixator or you kept the fixator on? No, sir, we kept the fixator on. So as uh, I said, most of the fixators were two ring fixators. So only one wire was removed from the proximal ring and that gave enough space for the ring to be inserted. Uh, when there were three rings used, uh, in that situation, it was a combination with a wire and a half pin. So the half pin was left in place and the ring which was in line of the plate was, the wire that was in line of the plate was the only wire removed while the length was held with rest of the fixator. So, so did you have to compromise plate. on the length of the plates, the number of screws, and did that have any consequence on outcome? No, sir, we did not have to compromise. So most of the uh, most of the osteotomies were in the diaphyses in 30 of the patients. So that gave us enough length, proximal and distal, to have three screws, or in the slightly older patient, four screws on either side of the region rate column. Okay, thanks. So, so John, a couple of more questions yeah. from the delegation. So, uh, what I was going to say about... is that uh, have you looked at, uh, have, have you actually done any transports with plates in your series? Because uh, we've done a few of these, and uh, one of the interesting things we found is the actual the regenerate actually forms faster and better with the plates. So with the locking plate, especially, have you seen that in your series? Right. So, so in the series, we had only plain lengthening. There was no bone transport. But as you see in the results, we did find that the bone consolidates faster with it the plate. Actually, plates. does very well. There are two questions from the audience. One, Premal is asking, what is the youngest patient you have? And second is from Dr. P.N. Gupta. Did you have deviation of regenerate? So, so the youngest patient was 4.8 years. And uh, we did have a deviation of the regenerate, yeah. but we were able to adjust it while lengthening with hinges. And it was within the acceptable range at the end of it. And did you have any deviation of regenerate? So we did have up to 19 degrees was the maximum in one patient, but we were able to correct that while lengthening with hinges before the plating. I think, Venkat, we don't have much question now. Okay. So can we move to the next speaker? Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Ishani. You, thank uh, you, so much. you can move to the... Yeah. Last paper so next, the last paper of this session is by Dr. Chinmay. He is going to speak on modified Velapu sling application for the treatment of fractures around shoulder in infants. Dr. Chinmay, please. I am Dr. Chinmay Sanguli. I am a clinical fellow at Autocrist Clinic, Ahmedabad. I am presenting my paper on modified Velapu sling application for fracture around the shoulder joint in infants. Fracture around the shoulder in infants are basically due to bird trauma, domestic fall, or malhandling in the form of physiotherapy and massage. Clavicle is most commonly encountered both, which was followed by the humerus fracture. There are some pathological conditions which were described in literature 
like Ostrogenesis imperfecta by Pfizer, and also case report by case series by the Waters, which described the brachial plexus bulb palsy associated with clavicle and humerus fracture. In historical mode of treatment, there is a wound resin splint and squeeze splint, which was used for clavicle and humerus fracture. These are the rigid type of immobilization. But as we know, infants have the tremendous capacity to remodel over the period of time. We come up with the conventional mode of treatment that is no treatment, cuff and collar sling application, adhesive taping, and sleeve to insert pin. Limitation of the conventional treatment is skin irritation, exoriation, unavailability of proper size sling, fitting difficulty due to inadequate immobilization. To overcome this problem, we come up with a modified velcro sling. So our current aim of the study is to assess the functional outcome of modified velcro sling application for fracture around the shoulder joint in infants. In this slide, I will demonstrate you about how to apply modified velcro sling. In the requirement, we need two inch stockinet and two safety pin that's it. First, we measure the distance between the two shoulder and up to the nipple line like in the form of inverted L. We give him the name as a distance A. We also mark at the shoulder point. Distance B is involving the arm and the forearm. We also mark at the wrist area. Distance C is 1.5 times the trunk circumference. Then the next step, make a cut of length A from the start of the stockinet and we also make the cut at the wrist area and the wrist is taken out from the stockinet. The remaining stockinet is slide over the limb in the pre-pinning position. In final position, with the help of the two safety pin, we pin the stockinet at wrist area and at, at the arm area. Material methods, 21 consecutive inference from 2009 to 2018, seven clavicle and 14 humerus fracture, four pathological fracture, two OI and two brachial plexus birth palsy. Modified velcro sling continued for three weeks. Infants were followed up periodically up to the age of one year. In clinical outcome assessment, range of motion, limb length discrepancy, angular malalignment or rotational malalignment. Functional outcome assessment was done by update of the quick dash, which measures the out outcome in excellent, good, satisfactory and poor category. In the results, average age of presentation is 35 days, range is day one to seven months. Average follow-up for six years ranges two years to 10 years. In mode of injury, birth trauma is most commonly seen in humerus fracture in our series. The clavicle fracture is evenly distributed in birth trauma in fall from bed. Outcome of non-pathological fracture is no limb length discrepancy, no angular or mark rotation, full range of motion, or update of cube dash showed excellent outcome. Case example for non-pathological fracture, this is the infant which was presented to us at day seven with humerus fracture, which was managed with modified well to sleep. At any years follow, on clinical examination, there is a no limb length discrepancy. On exhale, there is a no angular mar rotation. Outcome of pathological fracture, three out of four had a virus malalignment, one out of four had a rotational malalignment, shortening in three cases. On update of quick dash score showed poor to good outcome. Case example for pathological fracture, this is the infant presented to us with brachial pressure birth palsy with proximal humerus fracture, which was again managed with modified well sleep. On two years follow-up, there is a limb length discrepancy on clinical examination. On X-ray, there is a virus malalignment, which was demonstrated in X-ray. Limitation of our study is that there is a no control group, limited number of pathological factors in our series. In discussion, conventional treatment is associated with problems like skin exoriation, irritability, and difficulty in handling. Appropriate side splint is not easily available. Modified well sling showed excellent outcome in non-pathological factor, three out of four at mal rotation due to underlying muscle imbalance or primary bone pathology. Modified well sling is a cost-effective, easy to apply, skin-friendly, and excellent outcome in non-pathological fracture. More rigid form of splint required for pathological fracture to avoid mal rotation and angular deformity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chinmay. It was really a lovely presentation and good technique you have shown. Uh, my question to you is, uh, do you have any kind of comparison study or uh, to prove that this is better than all the which methods which are available? No, sir. Actually, no, sir. Actually, we don't have any comparative group in this. Uh, we don't have a... That, that's I mentioned in my uh, limitation that we don't have any control group to compare it with another study. But it is the safest method we can apply to the infants with good outcomes, sir. Sir, can I ask a question? Sandeep, please wait. Yeah, so uh, how difficult is it to do this Velcro in a newborn or a neonate as you show? I've always found it's very easy to control the varus angulation by just doing a apical arm to chest strapping using micropore, hypoallergenic tape. And it heals rapidly in 10 to 12 days or 15 days. Putting yeah. a Velcro sling uh, 
might be a little non rigid or non uh, i don't think whether it mobilize, immobilizes it adequately number one and uh, non hypoallergenic tape is good enough and faster so any comments and experience from others dana plus works very well sandeep isn't it yeah no, so no dana plus sometimes can have right. skin excoriation because it's too sticky yeah. Whereas okay micropore, a two-inch or three-inch tape is so easy, and most of the times the virus circulation is because uh, if you just put a tape at the apex of the fracture, everything is all right. Yeah, so big. And you can't really control rotation because arm is internally rotated, even with velcro sling. So I don't think you can blame the technique for mal rotation, which is really not a big issue. No, sir, but uh, basically we also strap the arm. The last part of the sling we are. Uh, Tie this sling to the arm, sir. So it will also immobilize the arm in a safe position. So why don't you just strap? Why put all this? So it will immobilize the full arm and forearm, sir. Right? Because baby didn't keep hand in one position, sir, all the time. In the micro pores in Dana Plus, it uh, always they move the hand, sir. And there are no. In fact, the they will move in the well. If you when you put arm to chest with cotton and across the chest, there's no way baby can move. He'll move as a unit. No sir, we didn't find anything that if they move it as a unit, sir. Because all right, have... uh, Ken, I think Ken, you want to make a comment? You yeah, uh, input. certainly, certainly, it's an interesting technique. Um, the um, the variables that you measured and looked at, you know, pretty much universally on young kids who have humerus fractures, they're going to heal, they're going to do well. So you don't imagine you'd see a much difference in. And some of the variables that were looked at. One of the interesting things that you might want to look at in the future is what is the perception of the parents, right? Because that's essentially what you're trying to treat in the young kids is they're irritable, you know, feeding intolerance. So if you did um, looked at outcome scores, assessing the parents' perception of how the kids were doing, it may bring some more valuable data because most certainly in a young patient with a humeral shaft fracture, you can pretty much do anything and their outcome is going to be good. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, input. Uh. Uh, can I say something? I'm Somaraju. So, yes, sir, uh, please. Somaraju, please. What you said is true. So, I use strapping for the infant and a very young toddler. But if it is child is evolved or under, especially the pro uh, fracture is more proximal humerus. I think even this velcro well technique will do well. It's more comfortable rather than the strapping. But for a very young child, definitely strapping is better. That's my experience. Yeah, even I agree. Yeah. What was your age range? Just curious. Sir, from day one to seven months. Sir. Oh, okay. So all young, because you said some older patients. They were just examples. I'm assuming. Okay. There was a ten-year follow-up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Tinmay, there was a suggestion from Rujita also that brachial plexus does not qualify a pathological fracture. No, sir, the uh, underlying pathology will cause the muscle imbalance that will cause the humerus angulation and all that. I'm considering on that uh, point of view. But whenever you publish this, you know, so you have to take into consideration. You have to be cautious while mentioning as a pathological factor, right? Okay. Okay. Venkat, uh, I think there yeah, are no are much questions now. Yeah, I think you can summarize the session. We have uh, one or two minutes. If if uh, if anybody has any question, any there relevant question, one comment from Dr. Sa Shalin Shah. He said. He yeah. is one of the co-authors of the paper. He has said that uh, maybe for neonates uh, taping is okay, but for more than uh, three months, he feels that the taping comes off. The child breaks off the taping, which is reasonable. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think the child is that strong. <laughs> okay. Okay. You can. You got to you go don't... all the way around. Could maybe if you put a small tape, it's going to walk off. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Right. Venkat, I think uh, we can summarize session. We can. Session uh, so that we can, yeah, we can we have come to the end of this uh, uh, first free paper session of uh, Pusicon uh, Virtual Pusicon 2021. I thank all the presenters uh, for uh, presenting the papers, and uh, I thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity. We have one more session for tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and uh, we hope to see you all tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. I hand over the session back to. The secretary and president for a next interesting session on the Samaral next factor complication. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Venkat and Viraj, for a wonderful management of the session. And I also thank all the presenters for a lovely scientific uh, 
presentation. So now we move on to the next session. And the next session is one of the most interesting, interesting session of uh, POSICON. That is a case discussion session. Uh, the topic of today uh, session is about the complication. And we have selected two moderators. One is Dr. Ramni Narsiam, and the second is John Kopadhyay. So they are going to moderate session. And now I hand over them for uh, this session. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Dhiren, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, John and I are going to present uh, three cases each, and we'll be alternating. I'll be starting. And what we are going to do is we got three panelists. Uh, uh, one is Dr. Kapil Gangwal from Jaipur. The second one is Dr. P. N. Gupta from Chandigarh, and Dr. Gopinath Menon from Chennai. And uh, what we will, what we are planning is that we will involve the panelists uh, who are delegated panelists initially for all the cases, and uh, we will take all the questions from other other people in the end. And hopefully, we should have ten minutes in the end. So without wasting time, uh, what we are going to do is... Rami, I don't see the... Gopinath Menon around. So can we co-opt somebody else? Yeah, Dr. Gopinath Menon has, is logged in as Dr. Gopinath Menon. That's what he told me. So if you Gopinath can... Gopinath Menon is already there. He is a panelist. So don't worry. He's okay. there. Okay. Yes. All right. Great, great, great. Okay. So okay. without he... wasting time... Show himself. So, so you guys can see my, see my screen. Yeah. All right. So we have been we are going to be talking about complications in pediatric orthopedics, and uh, you know when we talk about complications and then we you know start differentiating it between surgical, anesthetic, and all. But so early on in during my residency, one of my consultants you know admonished me because there was a complication in one of the cases in the emergency, and my first I blurted out saying that you know. This one is because of the patient had a problem because of anesthesia. So the first thing he told me was, you as the primary consultant, you are responsible for everything. So my just message to the younger orthopods is that once you have a patient admitted under you, any complication is yours. The, we, are, we are going to be talking about specific complications and I prefer to classify it broadly as iatrogenic, which is surgeon based anticipated condition based and unanticipated and it that can happen uh, at any point of time so starting with the case one i'm going to start with a bilateral ddh now here is a three-year-old girl presenting with a waddling gait noticed by the parents since the past one year when they presented to me no history of any previous treatment no other significant history and this is the pre-op assessment. So this is the pre-operative X-ray. So, uh, Doctor Kapil, so what do you think? I mean, how do you how would you proceed? Uh, so, Ramani, these are uh, uh, high dislocations, uh, unreduced. Uh, I think Kapil, uh, just one second. Uh, can I request everybody in the background to mute themselves, please? Yeah, carry on, Kapil. So, uh, so this in my hands would uh, require staged uh, uh, open reductions um, uh, first on one side, then on the other. Uh, staged probably a um, couple months uh, apart or maybe three months apart, depending on how the range of motion comes. It will be an open reduction, femoral shortening, and a pelvic osteotomy all uh, combined together with a hip spica. That Fair way. enough. Uh, is there a consensus amongst others? Yeah, I think uh, I think I will go with the same way, but uh, I would usually stage it about uh, six weeks apart. The reason is that uh, by the time you know you take off the plaster, half of the plaster time is overlapped, so that that's the only reason I stage it. Okay, six weeks. So uh, what about but Dr. Gopinath? That all depends on the family, but I would agree with the line of management that it should be a femoral shortening after open reduction, femoral shortening as well as a. Okay, yes, one small request. Let's keep uh, the answers compact and you know to the okay. point so that we can do the reductions. And that's so there is a slight difference the way I treat them. I do not wait for six weeks or one month or whatever. I just do it after three to four days. There, the, there is a the way I look at it is that you know 
the less of immobilization for the child and earlier we mobilize the child that will be fine because as till now i have faced touch wood no problems in treating bilateral vdhs in this way so that we finished it off in one admission and the child goes with a bilateral hip spiker so uh, we i do uh, same thing all uh, uh, proposed this is what will shortening uh, Amni, your voice uh, is going just a second um can you hear me now yeah can you hear me much better yeah, it's good better 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 all right so the various derotation osteotomy dega osteotomy hip spica and this is the post operative x ray so uh, dr gopinath what do you think about this uh, post op x ray are you satisfied it could have been clearer of course but uh, and i can i can assure you i was the one who put the spica and uh, i did not allow my residents to do it so so by and large dr kapil uh, dr uh, pn gupta any any comments yeah. on this i mean are you so, are I you mean, happy with this see I, the the right side uh, appears to be okay but i am not able to clearly visualize the left side all right I, so I fair know. enough so i i i i the, the clarity could have been better i mean there could have been a better clarity but uh, let us proceed so this was the immediate post op i we discharged this patient after about uh, i think 5 days and this kid went home everything going fine we called him after 6 uh, weeks or 5 weeks because from the day of discharge it was already 1 week so i generally call after 6 weeks and this was what we found on the right side it was dislocated so uh, dr kapil what do you think uh, the cause was uh, what was the cause for this what do you think so um i don't know what the cause for it was but probably uh, some instability after the reduction sometimes these hips do slip out posteriorly sometimes you derotate them too much they can slip out posteriorly so fair enough yeah but, that is one of the important causes yeah so uh, so ramni which side did you do first i did the right side first so That's maybe when you were doing the left you something could have happened no no the, 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 i will tell you why that is a relevant question uh, john so uh, here uh, the anyway the hip was dislocated and now i suddenly i went back now i went through the literature there was something similar you know the it was a, a eurasian journal of medicine but more importantly there was a study on the complications of surgical treatment for bilateral ddh comparison for two osteotomy techniques but more importantly we were interested in the complications that we were talking about they talked about insufficient rotation resorption of the uh, shifting of the medial fragment defects in the acetabular posterior part femoral antiversion insufficient capsular repair insufficient release of connective tissues but what they didn't talk about and what i think was the reason was excessive shortening of femur that's what i think i did because the hip was very very you know it was very easily going there was no tissue tension so the right side i did first this is a earlier case you know that early 2000 so uh, right side i did first i i think i over shortened the femur and that's one message i want to get across to the all other orthopods that we should not over shorten the femur one of the ways is after doing the osteotomy you put the head back and then see how much is the overriding and always cut less than that so that if even if you have to cut more you can always cut more all right so we tackled this at 6 weeks by open reduction readjustment of the distal alignment but see i had to put that wire which i generally avoid but there was no other option i had to put this wire for the next 6 uh, uh, weeks and then remove it and then uh, then we will see how it went i'll just show you the the subsequent side the slides now this was after 3 months of the second follow up and uh, this is a transition brace which i use for a month after 10 months of the initial surgery things are looking all right but there is still stiffness here because i have started uh, uh, you know this is the range of motion after one year i mean this is how the child looks and this is how the child is walking at the at the end of one year you can see the stiffness on the right side 
so this is the stiffness on the on the right side and was expected so we were you know i was emphasizing on the physiotherapy talking to the physiotherapist now this is after 15 months things are looking all right but the stiffness is still there this is how the child looks and this is after 15 months this is after 15 months this kid again slightly better things are going fine and we are still working on physiotherapy on the right side but this is what happens with 16 months you see this is now what what are your thoughts on this uh, john what are your thoughts on this well I don't, i'm not uh, it's difficult to say with the quality of the x ray but stress fractures at the end of an implant are not uncommon yeah uh, for various reasons uh, But it could have happened on the left side. But why did it happen on the right side? It can happen on. It doesn't. It doesn't always happen on the side you expect it to happen. But then, do you so think that could you could it could be various reasons? You could have been a bit more eccentric with your drilling or something like that. It's was it was it vigorous physiotherapy of because of the stiffness? Because of the stiffness. Yes. So that that could happen. That could happen. Yes, that could happen. But then this is the paper which I thought. could explain what has happened the effect media cast mediated immobilization on bone mineral mass uh, in they talked in adolescence but ultimately it applies to everybody in lower extremity fracture and this was the conclusion lower limb fractures are not related to osteopenia in adolescence at the time of fracture however osteopenia does develop in an injured limb in this case of course not injured post op during cast immobilization for fracture treatment so i think that excessive immobilization can you know increase the chances of these kind of stress fractures but again like uh, sandeep rightly pointed out there could have been over enthusiastic physiotherapy anyway it's a long oh, it's a long time after the thing for it by then the bone so if the hip, hip is continually back. stiff there are there are some people who at rural level might say chalo karke dete hain ghuma exactly yeah No, of course no no i i don't think they went to a quack it was a standard yeah. physiotherapy they won't tell you No, no, no. I, I was, I was very particular. But having said that, yes, I could have been now retrospectively. I could have been in constant touch with the physiotherapist. You know, it is not practically yeah. possible because child Then, is not an adolescent, and it's fifteen months down the line. So I don't think that paper okay. helps. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's new, let's I proceed. Think, uh, open reduction, internal right fixation on the on the right side. Uh, so we continued. Now this uh, this bone, uh, um, you know, it, it uh, united. <laughs> and uh, now this is four years follow up unfortunately this is not let me just uh, uh, you know let's i'm just stopping the sharing right now let us see i want to get out of this and show you this video for a second uh, how do i do that uh, anyway uh, let's uh, i'm not wasting time here do i have uh, uh, kapil do i dr gopina do i have the time the time is yeah sure actually. yeah so yes, let me stop this share for a second and uh, just a second let me uh, just one second uh, okay okay so meanwhile there is a question from yeah. the audience that do you think yeah, the wire me, has let me do let me do one thing let me do one thing just a second uh uh Okay, so just a second. Can you see my screen right yeah. now? Yeah. Okay. Can you see this? Uh, can you see this another this video? Yeah, yeah, it's wrong. All right. So this video was not playing on the uh, this uh, PowerPoint, but I'm just playing it separately. So this kid is doing fine. So just uh, reiterating. So let me stop this and let me finish off this. Uh, uh, okay, where where am I? Okay, uh, okay so uh, that's uh, Ramani. Ramani, do you think it's imp- uh, apparent to tell the uh, audience that maybe just an X-ray is not adequate immediately post op? Well, you know. uh not i don't think how many people are doing a single uh, single uh, image ct to make sure that the hip is inside the socket um I, i i don't think everybody does it even i now i don't do it even after this 
complication that I had because what ultimately I have uh, ultimately. So just coming to this carry home message, yeah. let me complete uh, this. Can I can I just chip in a little? Uh, if yeah. you are not comfortable with your post-op uh, radiographs, and if you are not able to exactly localize where your uh, radial uh, the femoral head is, okay. I think doing CT makes you more comfortable and uh, avoids all this sort of problems. Yeah. So what is see? Uh, let me um, now talking about. Uh, I don't do uh, on a on a routine. I don't do a single uh, image CT after the post op to make sure that the head is in because i make sure that i am there um, while putting the spica and we do a posterior molding very well but the second thing is i i have mentioned it before also and i i again reiterate that if on the c arm when during after putting the spica or even before if you find the femoral ossification nucleus overlapping the ischium uh, you know, then I think you're you're pretty much there. So it, even if it is inferior, it doesn't matter because you have released the, especially after the open reduction, you have released the transverse acetabular ligament, and sometimes there is a sagging of the head below. But uh, if the epiphysis is not is overlapping the ischium, then you know that it's inside. Secondly, you know that it's not lateralized. So I am happy with this kind of uh, situation. I don't do a single image CT. What about uh, PEN? Do you do uh, any I don't CT? do it routinely, uh, Ramni. I don't do it routinely. But in case in the post-op radiographs, I'm not able mm -hmm. to visualize the femoral head. Like uh, I in your case. In this case, yes. It was not clearly visualized. So in that case, I will not hesitate to go in for right. it. So that, fair enough. I think that's the message which should go across. If you have a CT uh, imaging then without uh, you know single image ct which is less radiating uh, that should be used and just complete that's important for the uh, the viewers and the orthoports to understand that pre op family counseling is always important proper pre op assessment and planning for these kind of cases need for tissue tension after open reduction i just told you that let us not get an over enthusiastic about shortening especially in older kids Surgery isn't over till the spica is put. So I would uh, uh, really emphasize on overseeing or actually, uh, you know, putting the spica yourself if you are in charge of the case and making sure that uh, there is a good posterior molding in order to prevent any, uh, you know, stabilize the, the femoral head. Anticipate complications, confront problems and manage decisively. And the family wants to see you using confidence, not diffidence. So that's the that's my first case. How much how much time do we have? Uh, so well Gopinath? beyond your time for this one. <laughs> no, no, please, please, uh, John. Sorry, hey. take over. <laughs> don't worry. I'll we'll just... see. So we'll see how we get on. Don't worry. Yeah, go ahead. And this is what I was anticipating. Actually, no, I expected Dr. Gopinath to tell me how much time. He's too polite. No, no, my, my, my uh, apologies, apologies. Okay, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, so we'll go on to the next one, which is a trauma case. So we're doing alternate. This is an 11-year-old boy who fell off a height of six feet. He had injury to his right distal forearm. He had a puncture wound on the volar aspect uh, and uh, no neural vascular deficit. So he was taken to an orthopedic surgeon who did a basically a wound toilet uh, cleaning out and put a cast in. And these are the traditional x-rays post the casting. Now, by about the fourth day, he started, uh, he had a window which he was dressing from and there was a discharge coming from it. Uh, that continued for another three or four days. And then this uh, patient went to another surgeon and he did a debridement and k wire fixation with closure of the wound. So this is the post-op x-ray at this stage. Okay, so the wound was closed, but again, by about the fifth day, there was swelling and pain. Uh, they opened the wound slightly and there was some discharge. So they continued dressing and antibiotics, uh, kind of uh, reassuring the patient that things would be okay. And these are his x-rays at five weeks post-op when the cast was taken out. Okay, so now the wire was removed and Again, he continued with antibiotics, but he continued, uh, which is what we see quite often. This is an x-ray done at seven weeks post-op. 
this is at 10 weeks post op and this is at 3 months post injury when the patient came to us okay so at this stage he had stiffness he couldn't make a fist uh, so any comments from someone from the panel just one of you maybe uh, uh, yeah. uh, kapil you haven't spoken big, yet so yeah so, there is a big uh, question kapil please point. because he hasn't spoken yet yeah yeah, so John, uh, I think there's a, a, almost a metadiaphyseal sequestrum which is formed now, and uh, there's a osteomyelitis of the. Um, so that's his obviously. clinical photograph at this stage. So, yeah. So I think at this point, I would uh, think of uh, probably removing the sequestrum and reconstructing the defect with some, uh, probably a fibula. That's what I would Straight do. away? Uh, probably the sinus is secondary to the sequestrum and uh, you could uh, do it two stage, remove the sequestrum and then put the fibula or uh, if it's uh, fairly clean, then maybe do it in the same stage. Uh, PN, since you wanted to say uh, something, see, just a quick uh, comment uh, so that we can move on. What I wanted on. to say was that there appears to be some amount of involucrum formation if you see the serial radiographs. So I would wait for a couple of uh, months, maybe uh, another six weeks before chipping in for uh, removal of this question. So that's the sign. Yeah. You would still wait? No, John, I think uh, uh, probably an external fixator uh, spanning the wrist joint and then remove the system and wait for that because there is uh, uh, absolutely there is a good evidence that it, a new bone formation is going to occur. I think, I, I, think, I think this is not a hematogenous osteomyelitis, okay? This is no. a post-traumatic osteomyelitis and yeah. we've seen a number of these and this sequestrum never incorporates. No, no, this have to sequestrectomy has to be done, but the length has to be maintained and you don't have to wait for the involucrum. That's what I feel. Yeah, okay. You can so put an external fixator for the time being and let the heal in that position. Okay, so, so what we did... Uh, so we uh, did a thorough debridement. We removed the sequestrated segment. We sent multiple specimens for cultures, uh, antibiotic impregnated bone cement, and systemic antibiotic spending culture. So that was what we did. We had to remove this entire sequestrum. There's a very small segment distally, and this is the antibiotic bone cement. So the idea was to go on to like a, a masculine technique with uh, bone grafting at a later stage. Okay. So then uh, at six weeks, he had completely settled his infection, his inflammatory markers were down to normal. There were no clinical signs of infection. What would you do now? Kapil? Yeah, so I'd probably take the cement off and if there's a good membrane form, then uh, just a massive bone graft or probably uh, I, I'm comfortable with putting a fibula, so I'd put a non-vascularized fibula in there. Yeah, okay. So at this stage, you can use any kind of bone graft because the infection is now settled completely. At that time, that piece was floating in pus, actually, just uh, in case. Uh, so uh, the masculine technique is a good way. So the question is also about stabilizing it. So you could use an X-fix, but uh, so that's the bone cement, okay? Uh, there's... That's the membrane, okay? So this is the membrane you have to, I remember many years ago before the masculine papers came out, we used to put bone cement, but then we'd scrape off this membrane, thinking it was uh, something that was going to cause problems and then go on and put our bone graft. But obviously the idea now is to keep this membrane because it works as a biological uh, membrane which uh, helps with osteogenesis. And then we put in our bone graft and we actually used the chunk of iliac crest bone graft along with cancellous bone graft and we put a plate. So this is a locking plate from the distal radius set which has got 2.7 millimeter locking screws. Okay, so um, that was, uh, and we also did a sleeve resection of the ulna because the ulna had already overgrown by then. Okay, so any comments at this stage? I'd be concerned where those screws are going. Are they in the epiphysis or so the plate is across the growth plate now? True, but you think that's much, there wasn't much left of that growth plate. Uh, so 
Oh, these lovely. screws are actually, so this is the interesting thing about this plate is that you can put in these four screws uh, in the epiphysis if you like, missing the physis. But I think uh, the infection would have taken care of the physis by then. Anyway, that's it. So you can see the screws are actually distal to the physis, but in a very, big, because they are locking screws, they give you a good hold. We also got one screw into the graft and then four screws proximally. This is him at two months post-op. You can see how beautifully the bone graft is going on to heal. He's still quite stiff. He was very stiff when he started out. And uh, this is uh, the final follow-up at about a year post-op. Again, you can see how nicely everything is formed. He's got back a, quite a reasonable range of motion. Uh, still some restriction, maybe a bit of pronation. Supination is almost full. And this is him at one year post-op. Okay. Uh, he's already 11. He may end up with ulnar overgrowth. We did try to drill the distal ulnar physis, but I don't think we've completely killed it. So that's something we need to watch out for. Okay, so I think uh, any comments before we go to take home? Yeah, there was a there was a comment from Dr. S uh, uh, Sandeep saying that yeah, sure. uh, could you have uh, tried ligamentotaxis? <sighs> How long do you, I mean, you could, I, I think, uh, but I think what happens in these uh, traumatic ones where you get this complete sequestrum and uh, they've had multiple antibiotics over a period of time, there really isn't much periosteum left there for them to form bone, okay? So I think you would need to augment it with bone graft than just ligament or tax, taxes. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so I think uh, I think op so there are a few lessons to be learned in this is that I think I think I don't think the initial debridement was adequate, okay. And even when the second debridement, when they put in the wires and then it started discharging pus, they should have gone in and really done a thorough debridement. Maybe they could have uh, salvaged that segment. It's hard to say. I think uh, when you have an infected non-union with a gap, it's always a challenging problem. And I think the masculine technique is really a useful technique, uh, which makes uh, uh, the chances of your getting healing a lot better. Plus the antibiotics in the cement help you because you get a very high dose of local concentration antibiotics and basically relies on inducing a membrane which has biological properties, uh, which help you with your healing. Okay, so I think that's the end of my this case. So uh, I'll stop right. sharing and Ramni, you yeah. want to start yours? Yeah. And, uh, so, so I'll come to my next case. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Now it's a similar case. Uh, the similar case to John. The only thing is, the only thing is it's uh, hematogenous osteomyelitis of the right ulna during infancy. So, uh, now this is this is the this was the X-ray which was there with the family, and we go ahead. The history was a soft tissue infection. They, they thought that it was a soft tissue infection. Invariably, you know, the local surgeon does an IND in most cases of osteomyelitis, as far as my observation goes in all my practice, and uh, local pediatrician and general surgeon sat on it as is so common. And then they, they presented, this child presented to us with a discharging wound forearm with a cast at one plus six years of age, somewhere in January, 2008. Now, your thoughts, uh, Dr. Gopinath. So this is your X-ray in the front. Now there is a discharging sinus. So how do you proceed? What do you tell the family? Yeah, of course. Uh... Uh, since the entire distal end of the ulna is uh, lost out on the infection, and um, uh, there is a, it is uh, active, of course, it's uh, showing a discharge, a discharge now also. So I think I will go in, do a debridement, and um, uh, clear up all the system what is there, and later probably once the uh, infection is controlled. Think in terms of a corticotomy and transportation of the proximal ulna distally. Anyway, we know that the distal uh, wrist joint and distal DRUJ is going to be affected. 
but i think right. that's the option that we have to have <coughs> what about kapil kapil sir child is 16 months old no no no, 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 no 7 It's seven years now. That's what no, I one, no, one plus six is one year six months. Sixteen months. Okay, sixteen. Okay, okay. So, so there has to be some other option. So, no. couple. Mathematics couple lesson. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. uh, uh, probably Ramani, this will uh, definitely require removal of the sequestrum to get the infection to settle down, and then since the child's young, I'd probably just kind of brace and watch for some time, see if some uh, kind of new bone forms, and sometimes uh, you may be lucky. with the uh, formation of um, some bone just with the remaining periosteum and uh, then depending on how it's uh, evolving one would take a call all right so we talked to the family it was not not just talking about debridement and uh, removing bone but we had to talk about uh, tackling bone gaps if there were any so guarded prognosis explaining regarding the distal ulnar physis because uh, you know i was hopeful even though we knew that the prognosis with an infective situation is very bad but uh, we didn't raise the hopes of the family we thought that maybe some uh, allah let us see what happens to the ulnar physis i tried conserving it to some extent but uh, that was uh, expecting too much so this was what it was there was a huge gap here we just put a you know we didn't use the technique which john was talking about but we just put a k wire there and uh, Eight weeks later, infection healed, but a large gap. Used the ipsilateral fibula as a spacer. So, like Kapil rightly pointed out in the previous case, I am also comfortable with a fibula. So we use this fibula, and we just put it. We told the family very clearly that this is not the 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 the, the you know a permanent kind of a thing, but we are using it as a spacer, and uh, this was it. So now next six months. this incorporated we protected the whole thing the graft healed the fibula healed things are going okay we are enforcing the brace brace is very important so this is the regular follow up dr pn dr pn gupta yeah, yeah. So this is sorry, in june 2009 got, uh, dr sramni sorry uh, my computer actually restarted so i lost the track of it Oh, okay, okay. Don't worry. So, uh, John, what do you think about this? What do you, what do you, what do you think? This, this kid comes to you with this kind of an X-ray. So, what, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, infection is okay now. Infection is all gone. Everything is gone. This kid is a very, very. Let me tell you, I still remember this kid was like difficult to control. Difficult to control. Difficult. Very non-compliant with brace. We had to, you know, the family that was struggling with this kid. Who was around uh, about four, three, four years, three years, four years old, three years old. So at this stage, I would wait and watch. I wouldn't be rushing into doing anything. Yeah, that's that's what we did. That's what we did. Now this is in prescribed brace, but non-compliant. The you know you see this now uh, again. This this uh, ra radial head is going out. So, uh, Doctor Gopinath, what do you think you you should do now? Yeah, now of course that. The alna is pretty short, and that is uh, the reason why the radial head is getting dislocated. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so we need to lengthen the alna. Probably. Would you do it? Would you do it? Would you do it? The child doesn't have any symptoms. The child is fine. The child is yeah. like jumping around, doing everything under the sun. He is four years old. Yeah, I can understand that he is a, a non-compliant child. But having said that, this radial head, which is getting dislocated, is going to be a problem subsequently. So All I right. think so, uh, we need to address Dr. it. Dr. Ramni, can I can I chip in now? Can I chip yeah, in please, now? Yeah, please, please. I Go. think there is a distal uh, ulnar growth arrest. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah, so that's whatever you do, I mean, I mean at at, you, yeah. at at this age of age four, either you have to do repeated lengthenings, which may not be a very wise choice, or you just wait and watch because if you reduce this uh, radial head back after some time. because of the differential growth again it is going to come out all right so uh, let me let me stop you here and now this is 2012 december this is this is what we are looking at so now this is what we are looking at the the kid has a little bit pain terminal pronation problem mainly but the kid doesn't have pain no pain terminal the mom is like you know getting ballistic the mom says you know what uh, i show her the other x ray you know, i say that this is the radial i am just explaining it to her 
द डिफरेंस शी से डॉक्टर साहब ये क्या है ये तो बिल्कुल ही बाहर निकल गया यहाँ तो कुछ अलग से मुझे हड्डी फील हो रहा है ये ये क्या चल रहा है शी इज लाइक यू नो एब्सोल्युटली कंटिन्यूसली क्राइंग यू नो एवरी टाइम शी कम्स टू मी शी इज क्राइंग नाउ व्हाट डू यू डू डॉक्टर गोपीनाथ या आई थिंक एट द एंड ऑफ द डे इट विल रिक्वायर सीरियल लेंथनिंग ऑफ द अल्ना बिकॉज इफ यू की लेट द रेडियल हेड बी डिसलोकेटेड फॉर अ लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम द शेप ऑफ द रेडियल हेड विल चेंज then it's All very right. difficult for you to reduce and keep it in place yes so so that's that's the message basically you know you it's inevitable you have to do something here because this radial head will keep on getting out and going out so this is the time when it became it became a little you know difficult to manage even though there was no pain we still we knew that you know if you just sit on it things are going to get extremely difficult later so we did this in january we put her this thing we started distracting we distracted alna lengthened and the radial head reduced so we were pushing the hand distally and the radial head reduced so the the kid you know somehow the family was very compliant in this the kid had was you know getting older and he was more cooperative then we removed the distractor and uh, this is in may 2013 this is what it was how old is the child so, now i'll now the child is at this point of time he is around 7 7 years 6 7 years now talk we just yeah, took a again. similar scenario multiple exhaustosis where the distal ulna is gone and it's clearly said that the ulna lengthening is safe reliable procedure for the treatment of this kind of a thing where there is the, there is distal ulna growth arrest an excellent results and reduces the radial head dislocation so now november 14 asymptomatic child again this head is going out like dr pn rightly said this is what is going on so ultimately what you want is to do the minimum number of surgeries in this kid so this mother gets you know i was used to this mother getting ballistic so i used to calm her down every time saying that the child is like you know doing okay the child doesn't have any discomfort if there is any discomfort tingling numbness please let me know uh then because there is a posterior intrauterus now all that you know keep a, you know constant communication with the family child was so no no prominent symptoms nothing 2016 now this is head is out but the child mind the child is going to school writing everything and it's a right hand he's writing with that hand his uh, his hand is like stable and it's no deviation on the ulnar side and this is in 2018 middle of 2018 so this is the time when the child was asymptomatic the mom understood what i was talking about the father was always stable but the mom was always now by this time that mom understood what was going on but what is important here is now you see this slight bowing of the radius which is happening even though we had enforced the brace and the wrist was pretty stable now this was an asymptomatic child and using brace in december 2018 there was some discomfort around the elbow with activity there was a bump you can see that bump on the x ray also and and here we still continued i didn't want to force the issue and it was not like kuch discomfort ho raha hai doctor saab jo theek hai we will wait on it let us wait on it we waited sorry we waited and this was in july 2019 now exaggerated symptoms there was some discomfort he could not write there was no tingling numbness but there was some pain so this was the time when i thought that something again needs to be done so what do you do again so uh, doc uh, kapil what do you do here uh, what do you think uh, how old is he now ramani how now, now uh, he is now uh, he is now 11 years old okay no no sorry he is even uh, he is 12 12 12 years old 12 okay. years old i think yes so i th- i think the radial head looks pretty deformed to me so mm. i won't try and do the ulnar distraction to put the head back in at this point <coughs> mm. um i think radial head excision um, probably I, i would defer that also for a later point unless it's uh, becoming painful 
so i don't know I, i'm i'm out of a really good option. so what do you think about this what do you think about this now the boeing is that is that uh, i mean That's is that okay are you are you okay with it to uh, alner shortening so uh, just straightening the bow out uh, unless he has wrist symptoms does he have wrist symptoms or he has elbow symptoms no he doesn't have wrist symptoms he has discomfort over elbow there is a bump there and there is some restriction of pronation supination terminal and uh, wrist is not really showing any symptoms at this point but there is this uh, ulnar bow john what do you think so i mean there you have basically two options one is to repeat the thing and correct the bowing as well or you go for a single bone forearm if they are willing to accept that single bone forearm why why should you sacrifice the bone why should you no that's what i'm saying so that is another option if you want to reduce right okay okay fair enough of anything fair happening enough. again okay? that's an option but yeah but okay. i would so, yeah. now this my, my take on this is that if, if now this if you have done a lengthening a, earlier and if the family agrees i would call, do a second lengthening again yeah that's what that's the first so option that's what that's what we did yeah. we did a we did a corrective osteotomy of the radius we did a distal radial epiphysiodesis we did a corticotomy and we started distracting the ulna see this is the perop picture i have already done that radial uh, uh, corrective osteotomy and this is what how it started and uh, this was he was 8 13 years yes he was 13 years then and uh, now he started distracting distraction distraction but you know there was this, this, this uh, uh, posterior uh, angulation coming in the posterior angulation this particular distractor doesn't hold uh, exactly so I mean, so yeah. this was something which i tried to correct but i could not to be honest with yeah. you what do you yeah, think about ramani, this at this stage there another th- ramani yeah yeah go at ahead at this stage that what one or two things you could have done one yeah. is to transfix the radius with your distal pins okay transfix the radius okay yeah With your distal yeah. pin, so when you lengthen, you got you got a better chance of the radial head coming back. And uh, I would use a stronger fixator, either an LRS type or even a ring fixator at this stage. Right. So I am not so comfortable using a ring fixator in the so forearm. So you can use an LRS with the LRS. Yeah. LRS is a good option. Yes, that this was. Static LRS is available, and it has pretty yeah. thin pins which you can use. Yeah. All right. So this is in 2019 December. and uh, this is in june 2020 now i could not i could have prevented this i mean this is yeah. something which i could have prevented but well, again you can still correct it <laughs> yeah we can still correct it but you know uh, at this point they of want. time there, there is no very gross deformity let me just show okay. you now distal ulna growth arrest there is uh, this paper in hand surgery uh, journal where the progression four cases of arrest of distal ulna physial growth was taken into consideration 7 to 13 years the progression of deformity appeared to be greatest during adolescence radial deviation and pronation were limited to various degrees no patient had significant pain or functional impairment but the cosmetic appearance was always displeasing indications for surgical treatment included increased ulnar angulation of the distal radial articular surface progressive loss of notion and displeasing cosmetic appearance i think uh, we, we we were going the right direction now this is the guy this is now january 2021 we're not done with him yet but he's doing he's doing fine i mean like he's attending school he's uh, functional see that short forearm i mean the mother has not been really she understands that we have been struggling with him for right from the beginning so this is what is going on so i'm in general what do you think uh, john how how is he doing i think he's done well and uh, if he is not worried about that deformity i won't do anything but if he is you can always correct it yeah so what do you think uh, pn i think it's a fantastic result and i i I'll agree with dr john that uh, i think you can just leave it as such if they are cosmetically worried then that can be yeah so i that is precisely what i'm doing because you know sometimes when you when you you should not raise the hopes if they come themselves to you you know you i want this i want that then you can you know counsel them and go ahead but sometimes you know giving them too much hopes is not a great idea that's what i have i feel dr gopinath what were your thoughts yeah i think it's a good result at the end keeping in view what he had before and at what age he had it also 
So, All uh, right. of course, it's always going to be a little short. That's uh, something you have to accept. So, this was an anticipated complication, but we had to tackle tackle it over a time. So, it's not you are one. The the family needs to be patient. You need to be you need to be patient. You have to discuss thoroughly right at the outset the prognosis. Treat the patient, not the X-ray. So, even though, like in this instance, the radial head is going out, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to treat it at that particular point of time. Wait till the symptoms come, or you there is the more you are really against the wall, and focus more on improving function. Keep the family informed always. So I'm done, uh, John. Your your case. Wait. Uh, so, oops. You have to stop. Oh, sorry. Stop yeah. sharing. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, Ramni, if it's okay, my next case is quite short, so I'll do my third one as well. Is that okay? No problem. Go ahead. Are you got 20 minutes, John? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, so this next one should not take too much time because there's been a lot of this discussion already in the first session. So this is a 14-year-old boy who fell from a height. He had a basal neck fracture, which was fixed with a DHS. So anyone, uh, any comments yeah. on this fixation? Yeah. I think uh, there is some lysis around the screw. No, no, this is uh, an X-ray view. This is the day after the surgery. I mean, the day after okay. the surgery. So that's a okay. uh, digital X-ray issue. Okay. okay. Yeah. So this looks good otherwise. Yeah, so if you're a 14 years old boy, but I would, I would actually cross into the head in a 14 years old boy. True, but yeah, but he's got... Yeah, but this is nice, nicely to do. Just looking at this X-ray, one would probably say it's okay. I'm not sure if he compressed because I don't know if he did or not. John, do you think the barrel and the length of the screw, there is a angulation at there? It's not going to telescope really. Yeah, so that, but uh, that's what I'm saying. So just looking at this originally, it's hard to say all that because you don't know the actual situation. You don't know how far the screw extends into the barrel. It's a short barrel and for a relatively long length, you, he could have used a standard barrel DHS for this one. Okay. Uh, but I think more important is whether he actually got any compression when he was doing his DHS or not. Because at two weeks or three weeks, that's the x-ray. And you can already see a slight gap. There is some sliding. If you look at this screw, it has come out a little bit. Uh, but again, the lateral looks great. Okay. Uh, so this is him at six months post-op. I think it's slid a bit more, but fracture is not healing and the neck is going into virus. Okay, and this is him at nine months when he came to us. Uh, fracture is obviously still not united. He's unable to walk without support and he's complaining of pain. So what would you do now? John, I always wish that there was a second screw which can go inside the head from, uh, you know. Uh, True, that's an option. Uh, the you put a thing with the DHS. Okay, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Anything, think, but that's happened, so we can't change that. Now what do you do? I think I'll remove the entire hardware and go in for a vulgus osteotomy. Okay, so yes, I think that's a fairly standard. Go, go across into the femoral head as well, actually. Across uh, the growth plate. Is that as important? Uh, what 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 implant would you use? I think that's probably. I, I, I would be comfortable with a, a one forty degree valgus uh, pediatric hip plate. DHS a, DHS pediatric DHS. Uh, no pediatric hip plate one forty valgus plate. Okay, so the new new plates the. Yeah. I would be. So, pediatric, yeah, so that you would use the four point five five point five system in this. Five 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 mm system. Yeah, 4.5, 5, 5.5. 5, 5 mm. It's 3.5 yeah. and 5. So it's no, 5 not 3.5. Mm the 3.5 would be too small for this. Too small. So 5 mm is appropriate for this age. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about? But, uh, yeah, uh, John. I'm just wondering why why did this implant fail so much? There's so much loosening around the screw side. Uh, is there any metabolic problem with the child? Uh, that's no. one thing. Which I... Yeah. So we did investigate that. Is vitamin D was okay? No thyroid issues and as you will see later, fairly normal looking child, yeah? Okay. So we did investigate that because that's something you need to watch out for, especially in India. Vitamin D deficiency is very common. And again, thyroid is another thing that you need to look at. Uh, okay, so excellent. 
Uh, now the question is of implant. So I think you have an option of a DHS or this, uh, now you have the new hip implants. And, but there's also an old implant which works really well, which is the angled blade plate. Okay. Uh, yes. So that's what we used. Okay. And uh, the trick about this is you want some lateralization. The, how you do it is by leaving the plate a bit off the bone. Don't drive it all the way in. And this uh, actually takes off very little bone and gives you an excellent hold. The hold you get with this is unbelievable. In fact, trying to take it out can be a real problem if you want to change your direction in the middle of surgery. Okay, so you're absolutely is... right because the, the, the cross-section of this angle plate plate as compared to a DHS, which is circular, you know, that, yeah. that is more chances of your coming out and allowing rotation than this one. This one holds the proximal fragment much better. Yeah, this is a plate, unfortunately, the newer generation has very little experience with. Uh, I think there are pediatric ones as well, which are very good for osteotomies. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, like I said, the newer generation has very, and it's not easily available uh, in the sort of proper quality as well. So this is an issue with this. So this is him at three weeks post-op. Any comments about the length of the plate? He's 14 years old, right? Uh, look, uh, I mean, uh, I think... I think the plate, because the earlier plate was longer, I think uh, probably the uh, angle blade plate also could have been of that same size, at least, at least probably two or so more distal. Because sure, it looks something... like that, that looks a like cortical defect there in the lateral aspect. So that's that's the just, for, just from conventional plates which tend to press on the cortex, uh, so that is something but, that's, but, uh, John, there is that's something you need to consider because this could be a problem uh, with a stress, a stress riser. Stress riser. Okay, so that's it's a stress riser. But these plates are not available in longer sizes very easily. Okay, these osteotomy plates, unfortunately. Okay, so anyway, this is him at six weeks. That hasn't luckily been a problem. He's going on to form bone here as well, quite well. And uh, this is him at four months. Again, if you, the important thing about the lateralization is that you get the axis properly corrected. Otherwise, you can have a long-term effect on the knee joint. And this is him at that stage. And then finally, at seven months post-op, you can see how it's nicely gone on to heal. And that's him clinically. Uh, he's able to run. He's able to walk comfortably without a significant limp either. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, so I think uh, I think we've been through a lot of hip fractures, so I'm not going to go into these uh, in great details, except that uh, remember that uh, it's important today to try and lateralize the distal fragment if you want to restore the mechanical axis. And the new hip, hip plates actually almost do that for you, but otherwise you have to plan it in your execution there. Thing with the DHS is you do get lateralization, but then that uh, if you over a period of time, at least what we've seen is that it tends to go back to the original uh, uh, plane. So, so the distal fragment tends to then medialize over time because you do you have a sliding screw in the proximal fragment. Uh, whether it makes a practical difference is a different question altogether. Okay, so. I'll go on to my next case, which is a slightly trickier one. I think some of you may have seen it earlier. This is a six-year-old, uh, five-month-old injury, which was initially managed with a bone setter. So this is not a true atrogenic complication, but a complication of uh, indigenous treatment. Okay, And uh, she comes to you five months after the injury with minimal range of motion. So it's almost just a jog of motion. Uh, and uh, that's uh, x-rays. So, uh, Kapil, you want to take a shot at that? Um, I think there appears to be a dislocation of the elbow, and I can't make out. Maybe there's a lateral condyle fracture associated with that. Uh, um, okay, not... yeah. Uh, anyone else? Uh, PN? I, I think this is a elbow dislocation. And I can appreciate the capitalum on the AP view in the on the dislocated side, uh, right uh, 
alongside the main shaft of humerus. Yeah. So, and there is a myositis mass. So, I think this looks like a pure dislocation to me. Okay. Uh, 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 the go. capitulum appears to be there. So, yeah, I don't sure. think so. This is a fracture of lateral condyle with a dislocation. Okay. Gopinath? Yes. I also think that there must be a fracture there because the capitulum is uh, not articulating with the radius anyway. The entire so, what is, is your diagnosis? It's most probably a dislocation, yes. It's a lateral dislocation with myositis. Okay. Uh, Ramni, you have something to add to that? Yeah, I also feel it's a dislocation and there is some myositic mass there, definitely. You know, okay, so great. Who... Okay, so what do you think this is? I'm sorry? Can you see my pointer? No. Yeah, okay. Uh, All right. This, this, this fragment is the lateral condyle, which is on. not really visible on the AP. Is it the lateral so, condyle? The lateral condyle is seen well. The medial condyle, so lateral with condyle is here missing. with the fragment. Yeah, that so what is this? Here. Oh, that looks like it. Yeah. That seems yeah. to be. So okay, so I'll show you a CT. I'm just showing you the 3D because. The medial, uh, medial the condyle, condyle gone inside the joint along with it. Dislocated elbow. No, so what's happened is basically the. Lateral condyle along with the shaft that's dislocated, while the medial condyle has kind of stayed behind. It's subluxed, but not. And the interesting thing is, it's united with the shaft. Right. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Type 5 kind of medial condyle. Okay. So now what would you do? <laughs> John, uh, can I take this? I'm yeah, happy sure. that you treated, uh, treated the John, child, John. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. See, I have the experience of uh, around uh, four cases of uh, injury where there was a lateral condyle operated by somebody else. With, it was a malunion and an elbow dislocation. Yeah. So uh, what uh, I did was an osteotomy of the lateral condyle and then sort of reconstructed the articular area and reduced the elbow back. So I would go in for an osteotomy of the medial condyle and reconstruct, reduce the elbow back and fix it with a plate. Okay, so approach? Posterior approach. I will take a posterior approach. I've what done it approach? through a posterior what, approach. So what I'll posterior take. approach? Uh, I will raise a tongue of triceps. You'll do a there. triceps tongue. Okay. Tongue. Will that give you a good view of the uh, articular area? Oh, In yes. The Cam Campbell's approach. Campbell's approach. Yeah. Yes, it does give. So, uh, what is the, it's, uh, is the elbow totally stiff, John? Yeah, at this point, it was totally stiff. You just had a jog of movement, as you can imagine. Yeah. So, then, uh, you because know, whatever you do, you'll, you'll, you'll be, you know, you can at least tell the family that something better can happen and nothing worse can happen. Sure. So, uh, okay, so we, uh, so there were choices of approaches because you really need to visualize the articular surface really well. Okay, by doing a tongue, it's going to be difficult because... Everything is lying anteriorly. And uh, so what we actually did was a, a trap approach. Again, this is some of the learning from the adult work that we do, yeah. which is a trap approach to the distal humerus. Uh, we didn't want to do an osteotomy. The other option was an olecranon osteotomy, which I would- In adults, you do that in adults. To do this in this age. So what we did was this trap approach, which is you take off the entire tricep. So in the lateral side, you take it with the Anconius, okay, uh, and you take it all off here and you uh, actually uh, detach this at the end with all this fascia there, okay, and then you bring it up. And at the olecranon, you have to be really careful of the dissection with the Sharpie's fibers, which are really adherent to it, okay. So you take all that off from the olecranon, and this is what we had uh, with at the end. Now, then you have to come to the area because this thing is lying right here. So it's really very difficult to get this with uh, what you were suggesting was a, uh, uh, it's different from a lateral condyle that way. And this is where it is. So uh, now if you can see the lateral condyle is lying here somewhere, this is the part of the medial condyle, which is lying partially in the olecranon. It's slightly off, but partially in the olecranon. And then you have to dissect very carefully, okay? So this is what it looks like in real life, okay? So this is the medial part of the joint. This is the lateral part of the joint. And here it is united 
with the shaft here, okay? End on view. This side is the ulnar nerve here. Uh, this is uh, the capsule, anterior capsule, and uh, the radial head is lying here, okay? So then you start doing your osteotomy. You take off all the callus. You get the articular cartilage beautifully reconstructed so that you have almost an anatomical joint. Uh, we use these 2.7 screws, a threaded wire and a K-wire. And then we had to put the joint back. One of the advantages of this approach was we could repair the uh, triceps fascia slightly more proximally so that we could get flexion of the elbow, okay? Uh, we did put a transarticular wire because I wanted to be sure that this is not going to dislocate again. Uh, we removed the wire at uh, three weeks and put him in, her in a cast for another two weeks. Okay, so those were the x-rays at that stage. Uh, what do you expect in terms of movement? It would be any time better than what it was before. You have done a great job. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer, Ramani. Okay, so this was her at four months post-op. Uh, this one K-wire was working loose, so we had to take it out at this stage. Uh, this is her at 28 months. And this is her at five years post-op. So not a full range of motion, excellent, but certainly a excellent. functional range That's of motion excellent. in what looks like a very difficult situation, especially with the medial condyle, which is a main articular part, unlike the lat lateral condyle, which has only part of the articular, main articular, uh, ulnar humeral articulation with it. How old was the, the fracture? The five, months, five months after injury, yeah. Excellent. I so mean, it just shows, goes to show that if your articular cartilage is lying outside, it does not mean necessarily that it will degenerate as long as it's not having anything rubbing against it. Okay, so intra-articular steps are much more likely to cause the cartilage to wear than if the cartilage is lying completely dislocated without any... So how, how old was the child when you operated? Uh, so I think seven, uh, five or seven, let me just say, I'll have to go back to the... Uh, six years old, so... Six five. years old. Excellent, Lovely excellent case, result. So, yeah, so can, can you and Ramli just make some concluding remarks? For yeah, this so this session? is my final thing on this. So basically, this is a rare injury, challenging problem, and you really go, don't get any help from the literature. So I think when you're deciding, you have to consider the disability as well as the benefits and risks of surgical treatment. So here, because the disability is significant, uh, you can you can hopefully make much th things much worse unless you do something which is a bit of a disaster, okay? So thank so, you, uh, and, uh, Sandeep. So I can can I take five Rami, minutes? You want to the do the case? closing remarks? No, sir. No, sir. We are already just two minutes before nine thirty now. You have to continue. All right. So okay. So uh, if you can uh, stop sharing. Yeah, just screen. doing that. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just uh, I'm not showing you the full case at all. Uh, what um, this is this was again a bilateral DDH. What was important to understand is the same thing was done, but a different complication. So the complication was, uh, uh, this was five months post-op and the child was doing all right. Everything was okay. We did not do any excessive verisization. Bilateral DDH, five-year-old plus we operated. There was a waddling gait which continued and you see when we when we when we checked this X-ray, there was an overgrowth of trochanteric uh, overgrowth. Now I tried understanding why this happened because the, uh, we understood there were there are papers which talk about uh, there are papers which talk about relative overgrowth because of ischemic changes, conservative management, and all that. But uh, and also there is an interesting paper of overgrowth of the lower limb after treatment of dysplasia, especially in younger age group. All that is fine, but nobody talks about trochanteric overgrowth after blade plate or treatment of DDH. So bilateral trochanteric outgrowth, we ultimately ended up doing a trochanteric epiphysiodesis and everything went, became all right. This kid, uh, this kid, immediate post-op screws removal and this kid did well. So that's, that's, that's fine. So this is an interesting, if somebody has any, any experience with this kind of a thing where there is a trochanteric overgrowth, which ultimately required a uh, greater trochanteric epiphysiodesis, that will be great. Uh, so this was the last case. So my, my thoughts, as far as this is concerned, no management is complete without proper follow-up. 
and proper communication is the crux one learns through one's complications no doubt but it's one's vigilance that would make the latter manageable so those are my thoughts so any other questions we are willing to take okay. i think uh, we are reaching the end of time so yes uh, thank you uh, john and ramni for a wonderful session and like we really learned from the complicated cases and the challenging cases so each case had a uh, important message so i'm not going to repeat all the message but now i hand over sandeep to uh, say uh, goodbye for today and uh, also to give you some housekeeping notice for tomorrow over to you sandeep uh, sir you can do that okay so uh, <laughs> thank you tomorrow we are meeting at uh, 9:55 5 minutes before the 10 am a lot of people ask us about the results so just would like to say that uh, once the scientific program is over tomorrow at uh, 1 pm we will declare the results for the posters and the uh, best paper session so uh, please wait for 5 minutes after the session tomorrow and with that i say uh, goodbye for tomorrow the same link will work so see you at 9:55 am thank you good night Bye thank bye. you very thank much you. Uh, dr kapil oh. dr pn dr gopinath and uh, john thank you very much and th thank you sandeep and dhiren yes. thank you all thank the you delegate enough. faculty and panelist certificates will be emailed to you individually right yeah. thanks uh, thanks to everybody see you tomorrow thank good you night. very much good see you guys yeah. bye good night yeah bye, bye.